Okay. So welcome to uh, edition of uh, the Celtic Stock Radio, uh, chat number 62. Uh, we are talking about uh, the recent uh, uh, Celtics uh, games and the Celtics results. Uh, I would like to talk also about the additions uh, at the trade deadline. Um, Fournier, also the trade in which we received, uh, 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 I mean, uh, Cornet and also um, uh, Wagner. So uh, also I would like uh, to discuss about the schedule and um, the next games, the schedule is not getting easy. Uh, the schedule is uh, entering uh, the harder part of uh, the schedule. We are playing Philadelphia uh, soon. Uh, Philadelphia, one of top um, uh, two teams at um, Eastern Conference. But uh, before that, April 4th, Charlotte Hornets without Gordon Hayward. Gordon Hayward will miss four weeks due to another injury. Uh, then we have back-to-back -back games, Philadelphia, then the Knicks, then Memphis, uh, Golden State Warriors, Portland, uh, Lakers, uh, I mean, not Golden State Warriors, but um, uh, ne never mind, then Portland, Lakers, uh, then Golden State Warriors, Bulls, Suns, Brooklyn, uh, Hornets again. So, again, the Celtics are around... Uh, position number eight. Uh, last night we uh, have had luck to defeat. Uh, I mean, had luck. Uh, last night, uh, luckily, we uh, cut the two games losing streak, um, and we defeated uh, Houston Rockets. Uh, we have uh, huge performances, um, and we saw uh, Time Lord um, breaking some records, all-time records. Uh, also, we had uh, Evan Fournier, who had historically bad performance in his debut. Uh, he uh, kind of make up in his second um, second game. I mean, second game for the Celtics because Evan Fournier uh, he just uh, uh, had seven threes at that game, and he showed us what he can do for us. Uh, it's his career high in uh, one uh, game, if I'm correct. Uh, so, I mean, against Houston Rockets, it was the good game. Uh, I mean, uh, we know that the Houston Rockets are not a good team, but um, and I would not say that this is the sign. This is the sign that uh, we are moving in the good direction yet. But uh, I think that this Houston game was something that uh, we can build on because the ball movement uh, was good. The defense was better. Uh, we, we had good performances from uh, Fournier again. Uh, if Fournier uh, can uh, play this way, he will be a huge boost for us. And somehow when the ball movement is better, the Boston Celtics are different team De defense is defense is really huge huge uh, subject uh and we slip down on the defense uh in many categories uh i posted a picture uh from the last season like winning percentage like from fifth to 18th and opponents points per game i think we are around 17th and uh, defensive rating below 20th. So we were between number 20 and 25th the whole season. Uh, why such a huge fall down in the defense? Okay, we lost some, some players. We lost Gordon Hayward. We lost Daniel Tyson trade. We lost Ines Cantor. We lost uh Bradley wanna maker but we have some new faces and maybe the injuries are the reason maybe lack of training is the reason but what is I asked Adam Taylor previously on uh Celtics Nation Italia chat we will play that audio hopefully on the next our radio show on 10th but uh what do you guys think that this is the exact reason why 
such a huge problems in the defense, such a huge fall down in every category of the defense. Uh, who is going to uh, talk first? Uh, Kevin. Oh, okay. I, I could go. I could go first if if that works better. Um, basically, like when we look at defense, I, I I think that the big reason, first of all, losing Hayward hurt us, um, and not even necessarily on defense so much as Hayward was a guy that you could put on the court and you could have him play some team defense, and he didn't completely tank your offense at the same time, and that's kind of the problem. I said that I think earlier on this season is that Stevens is kind of stuck in a position where he has to make a decision, you know, like, do you want more offense? And then you can go with people like, you know, I don't know, like Peyton Pritchard maybe, but then you're sacrificing your defense. Um, or you could go defense and you could play people like Shemi Ojale, who's a good defender. And unless you like, you have one of his like four nights out of the year where he decides to get hot from beyond the arc, he doesn't really do anything for you, out, you know, on the offensive end. Um, and I think that's, you know, I, I was kind of saying when we got Evan Fournier, I think that's Fournier is a type of player who can help us because he can play defense and actually shoot the ball and put it into the basket. So um, I think that that's useful. I think the other thing is just it's a weird season, and I don't want to use injuries as an excuse, but we have played a lot of this season. We played a significant portion without, without Marcus Smart. Um, and then Kemba Walker has been in and out. Now, Kemba doesn't help the defense, but the problem is, is that when Kemba was out, first of all, Peyton Pritchard, I mean, like he, he makes an effort, but he's not really an upgrade on defense. Um, and the second problem is that there isn't a lot of consistency with those rotations. So you have a lot of, like, you know, you could look at Aaron Naismith, for example. You have Naismith, he'll play you know, like 22 minutes one night, he'll play 11 minutes the next night, he'll play seven minutes the night after, three minutes the night after that, three do not plays, then he goes to 17 minutes. And it's really hard to develop the cohesion that's necessary to play in a switch heavy defense. And Boston runs a lot of switches. You can't develop that cohesion when it's different guys every night because you're not used to their tendencies. You're not used to where they're going to be. You're not used to, you know, like, is this something, you know, is this a situation where Aaron's going to fight over the screen or is he going to expect me to pick up his guy coming around the screen? And that's where we see, you know, this is where we see the defense fall off the rails is it's not necessarily we're bad individual defenders. It's that we're missing the switches. And that's how you end up with these weird situations where you have like three Celtics clustered together in the paint. And there's a wide open guy on the perimeter who, you know, basically gets to take a shoot around jumper because none of our defenders are even close to him. That's not necessarily defensive ability. That's these guys aren't used to playing together. They're not comfortable with each other. So they're not communicating. They're not switching properly. And then because you didn't switch properly, now you have three guys on one person and, you know, you have somebody who's standing out there in the corner wide open. Okay. I'm going to go back to 28 minutes. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. 28 minutes. Danny Ainge is going to he gonna, he gonna hang his hat on 28 minutes. That's what's going to keep Brad Stevens around. That's probably going to keep Danny Ainge around 28 minutes. That the the starting the projected starting five they had only had to only played twenty eight minutes to, uh, all season long. Um, Fournier is that Fournier to me is a, a version of Haywood because um, he can shoot and he can play defense. That I, I think that was a that was a good pickup for them because that's what they was missing um, a guy that could could shoot anywhere on the floor and make shots. Um, and he has no problem playing defense. The same thing with Gordon Hayward. Gordon Hayward was the, you know, other than Mark, Mark, Mark Smart, you could say that he was a utility guy because he could do pretty much anything and everything, jack of all trades, master of none, um, as far as what he does on the court. So when you lose him, nobody else does, nobody else picked up for that, um, per se, on the team. And the thing about it is, is you can look at, Marcus Smart and say that Marcus Smart was that guy, but he plays he plays so hard on defense that sometimes his offense is going to suffer. Um, where now you probably need him to score now more 
um, then you need him to play defense. He's going to pick his moments when he's going to step up and play the best defense he possibly can. So um, the Fournier pickup, I think, was great. Um, the little bit I saw of, of Cornette and, and, and Mo Wagner, um, he, he got those guys for a reason. Um, now, I know they shoot the three pretty well. I think they're like in a 38 percentile of shooting the three. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure where they are, but the games I've watched them play recently, they, um, they shot the three pretty well. Um, but again, now we still, um, I still think that we need to go out there, um, and find somebody else that can, um, give us some offense and some defense. And I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be upset if if Avery Bradley gets asked for a buyout, and maybe we get wrap him up um, because we know he can play defense. Um, he's won a title, so we know he knows how to play defense. Um, and he he takes the shot that's given to him. He's a good three point shooter too, but he takes the shots that's given to him. Um, so I don't know if I don't I don't know if there is talk of him with a buyout or not. Or even Kelly Olynyk. I don't know if there's a buyout for either either one of those guys. Um, I think they would probably be a big pickup because they kind of know the system. You don't. It's less you have to teach them, um, and they know. Um, they know they could. They both play good defense, um, and again, it's less you gotta teach them. So um, I would. I would mind if they if their guys ask for buyout and Boston goes after them. Um, I'd be okay with that. Um, as far as the schedule is concerned, um, it's, it's, it, it is what it is. Um, and I know it, 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 I know we don't want to blame injuries on the season, but it's been a weird season for the Celtics. It's been a real w- weird season for most of the teams. And I, I remember when Igor, when me and Igor talked before, and he's like, Jason Tatum is on um, – COVID uh, protocol. I said to him, I said, we won't, we will stay at 500 for the remainder of the year if he doesn't play in those next up, upcoming games. We were, we were, we had just won five in a row, four in a row. And when he gets back now, we're playing straight. We're, we're right at 500 and we've been at 500 since then. I, and that's how much I think it hurt the team that you had one of your main scores go out with COVID. Um, Marcus Smart leaves, he gets hurt, um, and that kind of hurts too. But what I don't like is when you go, what, uh, 7 for 35 or 11 for 35 from the three-point line, and most of them are uncontested shots, and you miss them, and, and you shoot them, you shoot these threes, and you got 17, 16 seconds on the clock after you just worked, after you just played good defense for 24 seconds and they just passed well enough to get a shot, get a good shot off. But you come down and shoot quickly and now you're not making them work on defense. Um, I think that that's a problem right there. I think that's a problem. Um, the game against Houston, good game. Um, I expected, um, I suspected Geno. Um, to come out, um, but Charlotte, the, the game tomorrow, even with Gordon Hayward not playing, Rozier, Rozier has a he has a point to prove to um, Brad Stevens and Danny Ainge. So you know, so expect him to to go off on us. Um, and if I'm Kimba, if I'm Marcus Smart, I'm not allowing him to get off like that. So. Um, uh, there's there's some positive things with this team, but they're more negative than they are positive. You guys know I'm all about defense. Um, you live and die by defense, um, and we I don't know if we'll ever get back to playing the defense we've been playing the last four or five years. Um, again, I'm gonna go back to 28 minutes. <laughs> I'm gonna leave it at that. All right, Igor. Uh, th- thank you. Uh, th- thank you. 
we have a couple of questions, uh, guys, or comments from Joseph Sforza. I want you to comment me. I will uh, answer short uh, if I can. Uh, Kemba doesn't help the offense either from Joseph. I would be fine. Uh, I would find him every time uh, he took a shoot. Smart. Smart should never shoot, shoot the ball. Uh, about smart, we discussed, uh, Andrew, in the last chat, if my memory is clear. Uh, now with smart. Uh, what do you want uh, from Smart? I mean, um, Smart is average shooter for three points. He had the season, uh, if I'm correct, Andy, in which he shot it close to 40% or 40%, and everybody were like, oh, Smart is becoming volume shooter, super shooter. But he returned to 35 36%, and that's who, who is he. Um, uh, Andy said, why is valuable Smart to take the shots? Because uh, the defense are the defenses are treating him like a volume shooter uh he's not volume shooter but the defenses are treating him like a volume shooter he can go off remember uh 2016-17 eastern conference finals with cleveland cavaliers with isaiah thomas when isaiah thomas was hurt and that game in cleveland he shot it like eight uh of 11 for three uh that long victory i mean he can go off listen um but I'm not for Marcus Smart uh, taking stupid mistakes like the other night, and I understand what uh, Joseph is trying to say. But on the other hand, uh, I would not say to Smart, you cannot shoot. Just I would say to Smart, you cannot shoot stupid shoots, uh, stupid selections. You cannot shoot from uh, 30 yards. You cannot shoot from over the over the hand. You can you cannot shoot stupid trees out of the break. But whenever you are open, listen, you must take the shots, your shooting guard or your point guard. If your shooting guard and point guard, uh, they, they, they cannot shoot, I mean, what it is? It is a joke. You know, your guards must shoot. I'm, I'm not for, for forbidding smart to shoot, just to have better shoot selection. Uh, Andy. Yeah, I mean, like, I think the thing with smart, uh, and this is the thing that I think people have to understand. He, he is possibly the streakiest shooter in the NBA. I mean, this is a guy, like, he, he could go a whole game and brick every single shot he makes. He could go a whole game and brick eight, you know, seven or eight shots. And then in the fourth quarter, when it matters, he will somehow make four out of five of his shots. Uh, and and you, you have no explanation for it. I mean, like, the guy is one of the, historically one of the worst shooters that we've had, but he holds the franchise record for three pointers made in a game. So I don't think you can tell Marcus smart not to shoot because I mean, I got, I, first of all, I think that's unrealistic. I think no matter how many times you tell him not to shoot, he's just going to shoot the ball. That's just kind of the Marcus smart experience. I think what you could do is like you were saying, Igor, you can hone in on shot selection because smart has said himself, he knows that his shot selection is a part of the problem. So I think if you're a coach, and this is one of those places where the coach comes into play, when Marcus is out there and he's deciding to jack up these twisting, on-the-move, falling-away three-point shots that are heavily contested, as a coach, that's when you have to pull him out of the game. You know, you send you know, Pritchard in, you put Naismith in, you put Fournier in, you pull Smart out and say, hey, dude, hey, shot selection, head like, like – it, go watch yourself take this shot and tell me if that's a shot that you should be taking. Um, because I think the thing with Smart is he gets emotion. He's a very emotional player, and that's what makes him so good on defense. Because you know, you know, Marcus Smart is going to put his heart and soul into the game. The problem is when you do that, you sometimes lose your ability to have good judgment. And so, because he's playing all out and his heart and soul is in the game. You know, he thinks he can make these shots that nobody can make, and he takes them. And so I think sometimes, you know, like as a coach, you have to recognize that you have to pull him out when he's in that sort of a mode and say, hey, man, you know, like you're doing great on defense, but you, you need to watch your shot selection. Like these two shots that you just took, you know, Steph Curry couldn't make those, you know. And I, I so I think that with Smart, it's not about telling him not to shoot. It's about really holding him accountable for the bad shot selection. And I think that's what we have to really do with Smart.
Okay. Um, uh, Kevin. Uh, Kevin. I, I I agree with uh, Andrew. Um, but I I do have a question for Joseph. Is um, what is what is it about Smart that you just don't like about him? Because you're saying you want him to be fined if he takes a shot that he ain't supposed to take. Um, I'm 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 a little confused with this because, um. You know, this guy is all he's a, he's a first team all defensive player. Um and being a first all defensive t all defensive player, that means he gets he gets he gets turnovers. His turnovers turns in points. Um some of them might turn into threes. Um I, I just don't I don't get it. I don't I, and, and there's a couple other people that feel the same way about Marcus Smart. Um his shot, his shot selection is questionable. Um and I think the only reason why he gets away with it is because Brad Stevens says the more you shoot, the more you make. Um, but as we can see now, it's not that's not working for us right now. Um, he said, I love his defense, his defense hustle. It's his offense. Well, I mean, you're going you're gonna to get the good with the bad when you come to Marcus Smart. Um, and that's what that's with any player in the NBA. Um, you know, you're not, you're not going to get a player – that is um, Michael Jordan, like as as far as being explosive in offense and being a shutdown defensive player. Um, I don't I don't know if Boston ever had a player like that. Um, if I if I had to say if I had to pick a player Boston ever had that was offensively good and defensively good, I would first person come to my mind would be Kevin McHale, um, because he could score. He can play defense, um, but I don't see, I, I don't see, I, I don't see anybody else on that team like that. So I'm okay with his, I'm okay with 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 some of his shots. It's just his his selection of shots need to be honed in a little bit more. Um, but that can go, that goes for everybody on the team. I mean, look, Kimba comes off a pick at 17 seconds and he shoots the ball. Ball hits the hits, hits the back of the rim. I'm like, yo, did you just throw it up there just to throw it up there? Because there's no way you thought that was going in. Like we didn't think it was going in. Um, so um, I, I, I get I get his point, and also he he says some about the Time Lord, um, give give Time Lord a mentor and hire Cousins on a ten day contract. Well, Cousins is signed with uh, the Clippers, right? Cousins, Cousins, is some, Cousins, Cousins, is Cousins is in Los Yeah, he signed he signed the Clippers. So, Clippers. um. It, 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 Joseph, I'm gonna say this to you: if if you want anybody to mentor Time Lord, it would be Kevin Garnett, in my opinion. Or Kevin That's who McHale. I would or want Kevin to McHale. mentor. That's who I would want to mentor him, um, or Kevin McHale. Those two guys, I would want them to to mentor him um, as far as uh, defense, offense. Uh, offense, I think we saw something last night where he dribbled, drive to the basket, and made up and. and Made a shot. We didn't. We haven't seen that before. You know, we've seen the dunks. We've seen the close lay close layups. Um, we had seen maybe a couple jump shots, but the dribble drive to the basket and make a shot. I I, I haven't seen that much. I don't know if you guys have either. But I was impressed with that. Uh, so I just think that his issue is um, understanding the the, the um, defensive scheme. And I think he's catching on now, and that's why he's he's getting a lot of playing time. I can uh, add the numbers, uh, Kevin, if you allow, and uh, maybe Daniel can uh, say something. Uh, Smart is shooting in his career 37.5% um, field goal. Uh, this season, he's shooting around 40% around field goal, uh, which is not blistering, but uh, it's above average on, on his career. His career uh, three-point field goal percent is 31.9%. This year, he's shooting 32.7%, again, above his career average. Uh, free throws, similar, 77, 78%. Now, career efficiency, uh, field goal percent, 45.9%. Uh, 45 uh, 45 this season, 49%. Again, uh, I mean, uh, under average in career. What is below this season is win shares. He is having 23 win shares in career. This is in 2.2, but those win shares are not only attached with, with Marcus Smart himself. It's attached to the team play. 
And again, I would repeat, um, I agree with Joseph to extend that uh, we need hierarchy at the team. I was talking about that we lost hierarchy and I'm the big believer in hierarchy of the team. He mentioned Kemba Walker. Uh, Kemba Walker should be ahead of Marcus Mark in uh, offense because simply uh, he's better offensive player, he's better shooter, and that's what Kemba Walker uh, do the best. I mean, uh, and you must know, this is not Kemba Walker's team. We talk with, with Adam Taylor. This is uh, Jason Tatum's and Jalen Brown's team. So Jason Tatum number two, Jalen Brown number number um, uh, two, uh, Tatum number one, Brown two, or whatever you want to, to put, Kemba Walker number three. Uh, then you have Fournier. Fournier is better shooter and smart. Uh, we talk with Adam Taylor. I would like to see the starting the lineup that is closing games. Uh, Marcus Mark, Kemba Walker, uh, Jalen Brown, Fournier, Robert Williams. And I'm putting Fournier ahead of Marcus Mark. If I want to put the ball in, 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 in somebody's hands to shoot me three, it would be Fournier, for example, before Marcus Mark. It doesn't mean that I don't believe Smart, but uh, I would put him to the bench because we need somebody to lead the bench unit. You know, somebody, Kemba Walker or Marcus Smart, they must stay at the bench units. You know, I think that uh, Brad Stevens is doing doing horrible job with those lineups. Uh, I understand that he is experimenting and I support him in that, but somehow you need to settle with the lineups. I understand everything, injuries, new players, you know, but somehow you need to settle with those lineups and this confusion that Brad Stevens is doing with his lineups, it is translating to the players. Players don't know what are the offensive sets. Players don't know who is taking the last shoot. And this is on coach, not on Marcus Smart. You know, if you watch the teams like Milwaukee Bucks, if you watch the teams like Los Angeles Lakers, Los Angeles Clippers, or even the Nets, you see at the end of the game exactly set, set plays, okay? They put the ball in James Harden's hands or LeBron James' hands. Then the uh, player is coming to the pick. Then they play horns or they plan weave actions or whatever, you know. What are we doing? Nothing. We put the, goal, the, the ball into Tatum's hands, you know, and then we improvise. We play iso ball. This is not how you play... Uh, basketball if you want to be a lead team. That's at least what I think. Daniel, uh, do you want to uh, say something? Uh, when did Cousins sign with the Clippers? A couple of days ago, again, uh, he agreed with the contract with the Clippers. Cousins is not available. And uh, let me say this. I cannot understand the obsession of the Celtics fans with uh, the Marcus Cousins and the centers. Uh, it's just like we're talking Will Chamberlain here or, or Bill Russell. Listen, Cousins is done. Cousins' best days are past him. He had horrible ACL injuries. Uh, he's shadow of himself. Maybe he can help. He's not a disciplined guy. He is locker room cancer in many teams. He has been journeyman for the reasons. Why the, the, the people think that DeMarcus Cousins can turn the season for us? I really don't want him to be in, in Boston. Maybe it is just me. Uh, Daniel? Well, uh, when it comes to the issue of uh, DeMarcus Cousins, I think a lot of people can understand why we wouldn't want someone like that here. DeMarcus Cousins isn't going to change the direction this team is going for this season. He's never got, you know, not going to take us into championship contention or anything like that. So why waste, you know, a valuable roster spot if we were to, you know, think of somebody else or even give him any type of money in this situation for somebody who's been proven to cause issues in the locker room and all of that. You know, a lot of people in this, in this, uh, you know, Celtics nation didn't like somebody who was similar to him in terms of the way he acts, AKA Kyrie Irving, everybody called Kyrie Irving a cancer, you know, not too long ago when he was here. So why would you want to bring someone like DeMarcus Cousins who's got a history of getting involved and having issues with players in the locker room when he feels he's right and the other player is wrong in this situation? As it is, we're already seeing the possibilities of issues between the players and the coach, issues between players and GM, and issues between the players themselves on the court. Do you really want to risk the potential of bringing somebody else who isn't going to play a major impact on this team, knowing that this guy is going to be looking to basically play for his next contract 
you know, I wouldn't want to risk that at this point. At, you know, so let's not even get into that discussion, ladies and gentlemen. Just get that out of your mind in this situation. It's not even worth it. As for Marcus Smart, I got no problem with Marcus Smart, you guys, taking shots early in the game because obviously the only way you can get yourself into a groove and get yourself hot is to actually take shots. My issue is where we're in the final minutes of the game, two minutes, three minutes left, and it's a one possession game, and Marcus Smart has already taken 10 or 15 shots, and he's only made, made two or three. At that point, you're pretty much as cold as ice, pretty much we can say. And yet, you got Kemba, you got Tatum, you got Brown, the three guys we're paying max contracts to, and yet... You're going to take the shots down the stretch, and they aren't. What's the point of giving those guys max contracts and saying those guys are superstars, and yet Marcus Smart is the one that's closing out the games for us? You know, that happened not so long ago, you guys, in one of our big games, if you recall, that we were, we only played, we were what, down three points with a minute and a half to go, and he took two of our final three shots. The third shot in the situation went to Daniel Tice. That was the last game before Daniel Tice got traded. What type of game plan is that? You know, you had some of them was in our group that were arguing with me. Yeah, but he was wide open. Yeah, wide open after basically missing nearly every other shot he took in that game. So if any team, if anything, the, the other team was willing to let him stay open and take those shots because he had already proven it wasn't his night. So if anything, you want a triple team and double team Tatum and Brown and Kemba and let Marcus Smart shoot because it's most likely he's not going to make it. So I got no problem, you guys, with Marcus Smart taking these shots early and trying to get himself into a groove because obviously if he can catch fire, then it makes it easier for our best players to actually get more of an easy time to shoot. But the moment you're in the final quarter and if Marcus Smart doesn't have 15, close to 20 points by that time, and he's already made at least a few three-pointers, there's no point to give him the ball down the stretch. Especially if you're not going to be paying him a max contract to make him look like a superstar. At that point, just let him focus on the defense in this situation and then and let other guys focus on being your go-to guys down the stretch. What's the point of bringing in 48 if you're going to let Marcus Smart shoot more shots down the stretch than him? For that, in my opinion, you just wasted your TPE for nothing, as I would say. If you feel Marcus Smart is more worthy of taking shots down the stretch than 48. Especially if you're going to talk about the future. So you're going to have four guys, not three, four, in my opinion, that should, that be, that should be shooting more shots down the stretch than Smart. Heck, I can make an argument that Peyton Pritchard deserves to be more of a go-to shooter down the stretch than Marcus Smart, based on his career numbers. So I'm just saying... Do not basically give that ball to Marcus Smart down the stretch if he isn't hot early on. If he's got it going from the get go, then fine. He, can, you know, once he's got it going, he's proven that he can make a shot from almost anywhere. That boy can be like Isaiah Thomas. Once the shot is going down from almost anywhere, it can keep going as much as you want. And you know, basically, it's just a toss up, a toss of the coin in this situation, whether it goes in or not. Pretty much from half from half court. But other than that. If he doesn't make his shots from the from the beginning of on the first half, it's almost a guarantee. You know, he could be basically right next to the hoop and the ball is going to miss at that point. So that's all I got to say about Marcus Smart. Anyway. I said it last week to you on our show when it was just you and me speaking for the, you know, the three hours in this situation. And has anything changed since then with him? Yeah, so I mean, like, if I could, Igor, just like other rotations, you like, I think I'm a little bit less forgiving than you are with the rotations. And I guess the reason to me is, you like, we just got Fournier in. And we're clearly not worried about integrating Fournier because we've played him in big minutes, right? So I guess to me, you just got a player who does, who approximates some of what Gordon Hayward does. So why aren't we using him the same way that we used Gordon Hayward? Because like, we're obviously not concerned about playing him in short minutes, right? Because we played him for almost 30 minutes in every game pretty much so far. So why are we not putting him into that starting lineup the same way that we had Hayward in the starting lineup and moving Smart to the bench? 
And I guess that's kind of what doesn't make sense to me about the lineups is you're like, I understand you're shuffling around because you don't really have a reliable option. But now you have somebody that you're going to trust to play those minutes. Why are you not putting your best lineup out to start the game? And I guess that's kind of where I, I differ a little bit on that. Yeah, but uh, I mean, Andy, uh, what is our best lineup? I mean, if 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 you want, if you um, uh, we 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 played the double big lineups and we discuss about that, but uh, double big lineups with I understand the idea, you know, I understand the idea. We don't have power forward. That was Al Horford. Okay, the ideal player again. Maybe we should sign him again. Al Horford at power forward. Then the center, we have Daniel Tice. Now you have Robert Williams. Al Horford ca can cover every cent every single center in four. Al Horford, if he's not washed up, he can cover the center whatever you 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 want, and he can play small ball center. And he killed in the playoffs 2018-19 as 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 small ball center. Okay, but then we had Gordon Hayward also. You know who who can play power forward. When Al Horford can play, uh, you know uh, the, the 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 small ball center. Uh, what is the point? Uh, Stevens run the uh, big lineup, uh, you know, with uh, Daniel Tice power forward and with uh, Tristan Thompson as a center, uh, and it didn't work. You know, Jason Tatum, Kemba Walker, Jalen Brown, Daniel Tice, uh, and uh, Tristan Thompson. It was horrible. Okay, you can make, um, again, a, a small sample size. Some players were injured. It, it, it doesn't work. Then he changed with Smart. When, when Smart returns, you know, he put in Smart. He put out uh, Tristan Thompson. Uh, he played four small, one big, okay, with Daniel Tice. And the, the, the trend continues. Now we have Robert Williams excelled. And as, at the center position, and somehow a, at least at stretches the defense is looking uh, better. But we still have problems with the power forward. Now uh, I understand your point that uh, you are alluding that besides the big three, uh, Smart is number four, and Robert Williams or who else is number five, and we should run that lineup. But again, you have Fournier. He has big contract. He need to. He's playing for the for the next contract. Okay, so you must put out somebody at the bench to to lead the bench. Is that Marcus Smart? Is that Fournier? I don't know. But somebody of of them besides Peyton Pritchard and 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 the guys at the bench. Somebody needs to carry that bench unit. You know. And in the playoffs, Brad Stevens should not must not put uh, five bench guys like Peyton Pritchard, Shemi Ojole, uh, Marcus Martor, Fournier, and then, I don't know, uh, Co 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 Cornet and Grant Williams. He must not do that, you know. You're stretching two starters like, like, like Brad used to do it, two starters with the three bench guys. Then you're having always, you know, the big three, like Danny said, plus Fournier, who can score, you know. Fournier said himself, you can put me off the dribble. You can put me off the pin downs. You can put me out of the double screens. I can create. I can play down low. I can defend, you know. So you can put me in different situations. I can put you 20 points per game. He won for Orlando the last game when he played before the trade. He won the last shoot. So... If I have to put the ball, despite he has historically historically horrible first game, if I have to put some uh, ball in somebody's hands at the end of the game, it will be Fournier be, be, before Marcus Mark, for example. You know, I just mentioned that I'm excited to see the big three, Fournier and Robert Williams, to close the game. It doesn't mean that the closing lineup has to be the starting lineup. Why don't we start, for example, Smart? Start smart at power forward. He played power forward, played big three smart Robert Williams, you know. But I want Fournier to close because I want to have 
uh, uh, more fi firepower at the end of the games. I think that this team, unlike some other teams, is more offensive than defensive. We must try to win the games, at least this season, with the offense, not the defense, because the defense is not working. At least it's obvious for me. Uh, who wants to speak? Uh, Andy or Danny? Andy, about the lineups. Well, I mean, like, I, I, get, I get what you're saying. I agree with you. I think we are an offensive team this year. We're not, we're not a defensive team. We don't have the personnel for it. And I think one thing that we haven't really talked about in terms of defense is losing Tice hurt us because Tice was our only physical presence in the paint. Like, Time Lord is very good, but he's not a big physical – like, he doesn't have the build. Tice had – you know, he was shorter, but he had a more compacted, stocky build where he could absorb somebody like Zion. And that's where you really saw that difference was in the Pelicans game because Zion had his way in the paint. Nobody we had could get in front of him and you know, was willing to get in front of him and take the contact from Zion. When we played them before, Tice did that, and he did very well. Tyson Thompson both did a pretty good job with that to the point that the Pelicans coach said in his comments they had to make a halftime adjustment to put in a stretch big to pull our bigs out of the paint so that Zion could score. And I think that's something that we really are missing. And I, you know, I'm not obviously not under the Marcus Cousins uh, bandwagon, but we do, we could benefit from getting a center that is physical enough to take that sort of contact in the paint from players like Zion. Because when you look at who we're going to face in the playoffs, most of those teams, like Brooklyn has Aldridge and Griffin now, um, you know, Philly obviously has Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons. We're going to face, the, you know, Milwaukee has, you know, the Greek guy. And we're going to face these teams in the playoffs. We'll probably face one of them if we make it to the playoffs. And you're going to need somebody who's got the physicality to take contact over and over again from those big physical players and not, you know, and be able to at least slow them down or make them work. Because, you know, people, people don't understand. I think a lot of fans never understood. Daniel Tice wasn't in there to play lockdown defense on Joel Embiid. Because, let's face it, nobody really locks down Joel Embiid except for Marc Gasol, right? So he's not there to lock and be down. He's down. He's in there to take the contact and make Joel and Bead work every minute that he's on the floor. And we don't really, I don't think we really have somebody on our roster who could do that because Embiid's just going to lower, you know, he's just going back Time Lord down. And I mean, Time Lord's athletic, but he doesn't have the physicality. He doesn't have the strength to deal with Embiid in the post. And I think that's a concern for Boston defensively. Okay, Kevin, want to say something about the lineups? Okay. Um, wow. <laughs> um, I, I, the, to me, I think getting rid, of, <laughs> getting rid of Daniel Tice, Tice was a was a big minus for us as far as a tough guy um, that we need. We've always had a tough guy. Uh, speaking of. Uh, uh, Tristan, I don't know what's going on with him. Is he on? Uh, uh, what is what is the problem here? According, is according, 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 according to John Carales, John Carales, Kevin is close to return. Uh, he's close to return. So he had COVID for this. This is the second time he had COVID. <laughs> Okay, all right. I, I, if if, if y'all want to believe that, okay. Um, <laughs> um, we don't have we don't, we don't have enough big guys, um, bigs for one, um, to advance maybe out the first round of the playoffs, and that probably might be it because everybody else has gotten all the bigs, and so it's 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 going to be this. It's, they're going to wear us down. Um, our lineup is our, our, our lineup. I think, um, I think they should try to fit Fournay in there as a starter, maybe. 
um, because he gives us, he can give you 32 easy, um, where Marcus can't give you 32. Um, and I think if you put Marcus on the bench and you tell the Marcus, listen, we need you to come in and play defense. And if you get a shot off here or there, then we're good because now we have, we have a defense presence in the second, on the second team where most teams bring in more offensive guys than defensive guys on the second team. So you can be that guy to lock whoever they have coming in off the bench down. Um, I, I would like to see that happening. I would like to see that happen too. Um, also, again, I still think um, I would like to see Jalen Brown be the point, be a point forward. Um, I think that that gives Kimba more opportunities to shoot the ball because now he can run off picks and things of that nature where he don't have to create because some of the passes he's been giving out lately has been good passes. Some of them been bad passes. I'm like, yo, you think you're playing for the Harlem Globetrotters? Some of the passes he's doing, uh, it looked like he's having fun out there, but still, some of the passes are not, not that great. Um, so I just think that if they were to make Jalen Brown maybe the point forward, um, starting to start the offense with him and run. Um, if you run Kimba off a pick, you run four year off a pick. Now you got two guys that you got to watch that can, can shoot instantly. Um, more so Fournier than, than, than Kimba, but that gives Brown opportunity that he can penetrate to the basket and that he can dish to whoever he wants to dish to. So, um, that's the only thing I would like to see change. Okay, uh, I, okay. I, 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 have I, 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 maybe it will be interesting because we're talking about that. Um, and, uh, okay, I'm not hearing echo right now. Uh, the, the most played lineups is the starting lineup from the beginning of the season. 131 minute, uh, Thompson, Walker, Brown, Tatum, Tice. The two be, uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, big uh, center lineups uh it's plus four net rating uh 118 offensive 114 defensive now if you put walker out and put marcus martin so thompson smart brown tatum ties it's minus minus 4.3 the defense is even worse with martin in that lineup now uh the third lineup is with walker smart brown tatum and ties so ties as a center uh it is even worse defense and but the offense is better but 122 uh, offensive rating the defense even worse 119.5 so only 2.7 uh interesting is that um, uh, some of the bench units like walker brown i mean the unit of walker brown tatum semi ties it has plus 33 uh, extremely good defensive rating 82.2 and 32.3.7, but played only 41 minutes. I don't have data for Fournier because he just came here. Um, some of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the other lineups, like seven on five minutes, not worth to discuss. But practically, we run the uh, double big lineups, and it didn't work, you know. Uh, again, I, 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 we spoke, Andy, um, uh, previously, uh, the, I mean, the idea of Brett Stevens, uh, pr practically, I think that he played that because he had to. Uh, he didn't have the full uh, 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 roster and the, the, the guys healthy. Uh, but uh, practically, that big lineup, uh, I think that he wanted to control the pain, to, to control the rebounds, to, to start with the strong, strong defense. But somehow, this big um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, lineup didn't work. And I talked with Adam uh, Taylor about the defense, and we agreed, uh, guys, that uh, the problems about our defense, which is uh, uh, really bad this season, uh, our fir first, and what we talk about, the first line of the defense is easy to penetrate, uh, par partially because the guards are small and partially because of the schemes. We are switch heavy defense, we defend uh, side pick and roll with uh, ice. 
And, you know, uh, because probably lack of practicing time, the guys get easy confused in the switches, uh, you know, in the back curve. So we are easy to penetrate in the first line. Then what our defense is doing? Our center is stepping out, you know, to prevent the to prevent the easy dunk and penetration. Now we are helping uh, from the side. This is called like uh, uh, weak eye and close eye. So we are helping usually from the close eye side, uh, three or four. And what is going on? You know, opposition player is stopping, uh, making pivot, outlet pass to the open guy, and then bang the open three. This is how we are usually, you know, or couple of passes, you know, couple of passes, they are making our guys into the rotations. And usually, uh, you know, uh, our rotation uh, eventually could not cover the outside guy. And that's how we are allowing, we are allowing a lot of uh, open trees, you know. Uh, also, we have problems with massive centers, with uh, the, the, the teams that are playing physical. Uh, I agree with Andy. We would, we would um, I, I would like one massive center banger, you know, but I'm against the Marcus Cousins concretely uh, from a from couple of reasons. First, I think that he is washed up. And second, what I hear is, uh, again, that he is bad locker room guy. And I think that we are uh, enough, enough of uh, the problems outside of the court. I, I mean, we don't need any more problems. At least that's, that's me. Uh, somebody wants to add something? Daniel, maybe? Well, when it comes to the rotations you all just mentioned in this case, I would say clearly you guys made it made it obvious, as you said earlier, this team doesn't have de a, a defensive mindset. We can't have a defensive mindset because really, who do we have to be that defensive anchor? You know, the closest guy you can think of is Time Lord to be the Kevin Garnett, who used to be the defensive anchor of this team back when we won a championship in 2008. But the game was so different back then compared to the way it's played nowadays in this case. The way the rules have changed, the way the officiating kind of, you know, does things now. The game is more, you know, officiated towards trying to make sure we see 150 over, you know, for one team to 140 for the other. So, really, the, you know, the fans today want to see games that are more about really the highlight dunks and the teams really making half-court shots compared to actually seeing a team win in a defensive struggle. So, I think, overall, if we're going to have a chance of winning, you may just have to forget about trying to win defensively and try to focus on getting players who can actually score you 30 and 40 points apiece a night. Why do you think all the teams who basically are winning and are being the best teams in the league are the ones succeeding because they're the ones getting the players who are still, despite the fact that they're older, they're the ones who are getting you those big-time points and forgetting about playing defense. Look at LeBron, you guys. Why does LeBron still manage to be one of the best, if not the best player in the NBA every year? The guy puts a lackluster you know, type mentality on defense and puts all his focus on the offense. Takes, a, you know, a, a game off every once in a while that he feels the game doesn't really mean anything to him in this situation or to his team and really tries to focus on the games that are really important. You don't think if basically our guys would have, would have had that same mentality and we would have had someone like LeBron, somebody who really was an elite star, Alongside Tatum and Brown, we wouldn't do we wouldn't be up there with those guys at this point. Even with someone like Brad Stevens as a coach and Danny Ainge as a GM, no, we would. The problem is we just don't have that star that can really bring in the secondary stars that need to be here. Again, LeBron James, no matter where he's gone, has always been a magnet. Let's just call it like that. Whether it's been Cleveland, whether it's Miami, whether it's the Lakers, 
He's always been a magnet, being able to draw in those secondary stars, secondary free agents who are willing to basically take, you know, the little chunk change to jump on the bandwagon with them. If you're in a high, you're in a, one, of, one of those big markets, the players do it as well. You know, it doesn't matter who the stars are on your team; they're willing to take the chunk change to jump on the on the bandwagon at this point. Look at look at the Brooklyn Nets. Can we say the Brooklyn Nets at this point are winning their games because of the fact that they're a defensive juggernaut? They're winning games 80 to 70? No. They're winning because they're scoring massive points. And it doesn't matter who they're against. As long as they can outscore them, that's all that matters. In the end, it's all about whether you get the W or you get the L. It doesn't matter how you end up getting it to the fans. And that's what we got to look at. Daniel Tice, you guys, I said it last week, and the, the same day we even traded him. That was a financial, financial decision. Us trading him had nothing to do with Daniel Tice's, you know, stats or Daniel Tice's mentality as a player or anything like that. That was simply the fact that you had to, that Danny Ainge knew this summer he had to decide who are you gonna pay, Daniel Tice or Fournier. At that point, you gotta choose one of those two because Daniel Tice was gonna be looking to make more money at this point, knowing that pretty much he was getting better at making his threes. He was going to demand more money, and there were going to be other teams interested in trying to give him more money than what you were paying him this season. So you can either, A, let Daniel Tice walk and look, look and hope that maybe the money you, that you were probably going to have to give him could be used to possibly convince Fournier to stay, or basically let Fournier go and basically get Daniel Tice to stay. But at that point, that pretty much means... As I was saying, you basically brought Fournier in for nothing and ruined the TPE for for nothing. Which means you never should have brought Fournier to begin with. So getting rid of Daniel Tice was just simply for that. Taking his money so you can give it to Fournier as a way of trying to convince Fournier to stay. So this has nothing to do with Daniel Tice the player. It's simply Daniel Tice's money situation. Daniel Tice now can go and get his contract somewhere else. The contract he definitely deserves because, as you guys said, you know it's he you know he doesn't have the body to you know compete with guys like Embiid and all of them. But in terms of you know shot making and all that, he can make those guys work in this situation, which is why he's going to make more than the five million dollars he was basically getting paid this season from the Celtics at this point. So, I feel we need a we need another score which is why we've been rumored to possibly try and go after Bradley Beal this summer. In this case, if you can do that and possibly try to keep, you know, Tatum, Brown, and Kemba, well, then now you got a chance where you can try to outscore all these other teams if you can get all those guys to really have big games at the exact same time, especially if you can still find a way to keep Fournier with you going into next season. Thing is, I just don't simply know how Danny Ainge is going to be able to really work that knowing that's really going to cost you a lot of money in the end, knowing that you especially wasted already pretty much all of your valuable assets. Uh, I uh, I want to add a couple of statistics. Um, Joseph asked, what is Marcus Smart plus minus overall? Marcus Smart is pl uh, plus. Marcus Smart uh, in the season that everybody's minus is plus 1.4. Also, when you look at advanced statistics, Marcus Smart uh, net rating is plus 2.1. His offensive uh, rating is 111.9. Defensive rating 109.8. Net rating 2.1. That is meaning that we are outscoring opponents with Marcus Smart on the floor. 2.1 points per 100 possessions. I hope that we finished with Marcus Smart subject. Now, I want to ask, I mean, about Bradley Bill. I don't want to open the Pandora box about Bradley Bill and dreaming with the open eyes. I mean, uh, I struggle to see why uh, Washington Wizards would trade Bradley Bill to Boston. And the people say, okay, give, give them Kemba Walker and uh, add a young player and the picks. Uh, I, I mean, somebody in Washington must, must be crazy you know or must be nuts to take Kemba Walker with his performances for Bradley uh, ask yourself I mean Celtics fans ask yourself 
if you are general manager of Washington Wizards, would you trade Bradley Beal for Kemba Walker and the pick and somebody of our youngsters, even Robert Williams? Uh, never mind. I would not. Why would you trade? And about Bradley Beal, again, maybe he will be traded to Boston. Maybe I'm wrong, you know, but uh, it's hard for me to see uh, how we can perform that trade unless we trade Jalen Brown for him. Now they are going to listen to us. We are offering Jalen Brown and Marcus Mark, but why would you offer Jalen Brown for Bradley Beal? I mean, you can argue that Bradley Beal has higher upside than Marcus uh, uh, Jalen Brown, but this is questionable. You know, better fit with, with Jason Tatum, maybe, but are you getting in the same class with uh, uh, Brooklyn Nets with Bradley Beal instead of Jalen Brown? I don't think so. Jalen Brown is a very good player. So again, it's conundrum. And Daniel uh, said it. Our owner, Celtics fans, you must realize it. Our owner is not going to pay the tax for these kind of teams. Now, the fans are saying, okay, but I don't care. You know, he should pay the tax. But he doesn't. Okay, maybe this is the truth. You know, somebody told me, owner bought the franchise for $300 million. Now it's $3 billion. So he should pay the tax. That's really nice. But it's not, it's not going to happen. Guess what? So you have Daniel Tice for, for salary dump move, dump move. And everybody is asking why this happened. So that's why I questioned Fournier because, and I have article about Fournier, but I will allow Andy and Kevin uh, to, 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 to tell me uh, what do, do they think. Uh, if, if we have time, maybe we will return to uh, the, the, the defense. But... Uh, what it is bothering me, uh, Kevin and Andy, is that um, the season is not over, but everybody is asking like it's off season. Okay, who would you sign to improve your team? D dear Celtics fans, as long as the Celtics are eliminated in the playoffs, the season is on. Okay, and until the season is on, I really think that uh, those stories, for example, uh, right now when we are talking, uh, some site is posting that Bradley Bill would post, uh, sign with us from personal reasons. Okay, really nice. But again, th those kind of stories are distraction for the team. This is first, first thing. And second thing, those kind of stories are spin. You know, they are... Uh, taking us away from the essence. And the essence is what we talk here. The defense, the offense, the lineups, the games. How can we improve? How can we get to the number six seed and eliminate the Bucks or the Nets in the playoffs potentially? I didn't give up that, that cause. I don't know. Maybe you Celtics fans think about the offseason and, you know, signing Bradley Beal. I don't because... The most important thing for me in basketball is the playoffs, and the playoffs didn't start. That's what it, it is bugging me. Kevin, <laughs> want to say something? Want to say something? Um, <clears throat> um, the situation with Bradley Bill is more of a, a, a Jason Tatum um thing, um, where him and him and Jason are become very good friends, and he thinks that he can make the team better. But again. If you give, if you go after Bradley Bill, you're giving up Smart, and you're probably getting up Tatum. I mean, you're giving up Brown, and you're gonna give up some some draft choices. Um, and so you're so basically what you're doing, like Daniel was saying, now you're going strictly. He's like, all right, all the time we gotta play defense is the last two minutes of every quarter, or last minute of every quarter, but we can outscore everybody. The key number to all of this, though, guys, remember this. It's 122 points. I think if you can score 122 points, you can stay in the game with, with, with definitely with uh, the Knicks. I mean the Nets. Um, that's the only team out there I think that can score 122 points on a consistent basis. Nobody else out there can do it. Um, I think that, and I, I think by with the Nick with the Nets done, 
is now they put everybody on notice that we're going to play defense when we got to play defense, but we're going to play or we're going to be strictly offense. We're going to be, we're like the, the Golden State 2.0 team um, where we can score. We scored five threes in a, in, a, in less than a minute or so, and you're still shooting two, so you're still going to be behind. Um, so that might be where boss thought mindsets might be, but I, I I don't I still don't like it because for simple fact that defense offense gets you to the championship, but defense wins it for you. Um, that's the way I look at it. That's the way it's always been, in my opinion. Um, and if anybody's seen it any differently, then you tell me a team that, that, that won a championship, didn't play defense and, or, or the team scored more points than other team. And I'm going to tell you, you're a liar. Um, I, I would like to see Bradley Bill on the team. Um, it, but I don't know if it's going to happen. I mean, he may. I'm gonna say this: if if they fire the coach, then they're probably gonna probably restart over, with the intent of maybe moving Bradley Bill to rebuild a team. Um, but right now, they're saying Bradley Bill is LeBron. He's a Le- LeBron James of the Washington Wizards. He gets what he wants, does what he says. I mean, gets what he wants, does what he wants to do, and comes and goes as he pleases. Okay, he's that type of player, and so. Are you give? Will you? Are you willing to give up the sacrifice for all of that to go to another team? I don't know. It, but at the end of the day, if you want to win a championship, there's some, some, there's going to be some type of sacrifice that has to be made. Um. So, um, come free agency wise, I mean, there's a lot of players out there. Um. Again, Boston has not been the greatest destination for free agents, and we all know why. Okay. Um. And it gotta be. It gotta be. The conversation has had to had the conversation has has had to had been talked about prior to this now. All star break or um during the summertime, they cooking out or grilling or they in Jamaica chilling, having a party, whatever. And Jason says to Bradley, "Yo, come on over to Boston, man, and let's see if we can make this thing happen." Don't act, you know? We want you here, you know. We want you to come to Boston. Um. But don't try to hurt us in, in coming to Boston. You know what I'm saying? And so those conversations are being had. That I'm, I'm pretty sure those conversations are being had because the rumor has been stirring the pot a whole lot more lately now than before. Um, but again, we're in, we're the season's still in. We're still in it. Um, we're still in it to win it until we're eliminated. Then we can really concentrate on free agency. We can concentrate on the draft, things of that nature. Um, those are things that we look for in, in, in the future, but right now we're talking about the present. Um, and we all know that there's some major issues with this team, but I think by adding Fournier to the team, I think you've seen what type of team, uh, how many points they scored last night? 116, 118, something like that. So they were four points away from 122. Okay. so. Are they going to have another night like that? I don't know because they just can't consistently throw the pass the ball around like that and, and play that type of ball. Um, that's what we've been asking for all season long from the very beginning. And we get it in spurts. Um, we get it in one game, then we don't get another game. Then we get another game, then we don't get another game. We haven't seen it in, in four consecutive games in a row where they played that well. Um, and that's the that's the medicine right there. That's going to make things work for them because every time they play that well, they win. I don't understand how they can how they can get away from that 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 um that the medicine that they that they taken during that time period. So, um, Bradley Bill, I, I welcome I welcome welcome to the Celtics. Um, um, I don't know if I'm all in it if they want to trade Jalen Brown because I still think Jalen Brown has a higher ceiling because he's younger than Bradley Bill. Right now, Bradley Bill is up in age a little bit, but he's a good ball player. Does Brad, now, let me ask you guys a question. If we were to trade Bradley Bill and Jalen Brown, how close does that get us, how close does that make us going to the NBA Finals? 
Um, I mean, um, um, any nice question. Uh, nice question. We uh, want to answer uh, any. I want to uh, uh, ask. Add some statistics. Uh, somebody mentioned of us the nets. I think you, Kevin, and their st uh, statistics. Uh, I think that they're uh, posting uh, post James Harden trade the best offensive rating uh, in the history of uh, the league. And about the defense, I think that uh, their defense is up to number 14 right now in the NBA, I think post All-Star break. So they are figuring out, besides, like uh, we, we said, they signed the players, you know, Lamar Lamarcus Aldridge and uh, who else was, uh, yeah, Blake Griffin. Griffin is play playing uh, good for them. So, I mean, like expected, they will figure it out. They will not be top 10 defense, but they will they will win the games with uh, the offense. About the offense, Kevin, you are spot on. That's why I want uh, the, the, the offensive-minded lineup with Fournier uh, to play at the end of the game as, as much as it is possible. You know, efficient lineups because only uh, a chance to defeat uh, the opponent uh, for me is to outscore him. Uh, with the trees or with dribble penetration, I don't uh, mind. But when we score, like Kevin said, 120 points and more, it's likely that we will win uh, the games and we will be even close with uh, the Brooklyn Nets. Uh, Andy, your opinion about the bill and what, what we're talking about? Go, go ahead. Kevin. Kevin. Um, Kevin. Quick question. Has any team ever won the NBA Finals that was not in the top 10 in defense? I think that many all the State Warriors, but uh, they were mm, maybe 11th or 12th in the defense, but uh, number one in the offense, you know. So uh, the receipt is either top both top five in defense in offense and one of category must be top three you know uh top three in offense or top three in defense uh but uh, you're you're correct the most of the teams are top five uh or top ten in the defense that won the nba title that's that's true so both top uh five in the defense in the offense and last year we were number four and five in offense and defense in the whole NBA, you know. That's why I asked at the beginning of the show how this big, I mean, big slide, okay, we lost the players, I mean, but we had injuries, COVID, but I mean, this is not big difference when you uh, watch the roster, like two or three players, okay, it's very important player, but how it's possible that we slide for number four or five to 18 or 20 or 25? Andy, I mean, <laughs> that's still what I want to, to know. Well, I mean, like, so first of all, um, I, I think the Golden State Warriors were definitely a top 10 defense. They may have been a top five defense when they won. The only year I'm questioning is that last 17-18 uh, season when they won. I'm not sure that year. I know their defense slid that year. But they also faced a historically bad Cavaliers team. I mean, you know, J.R. Smith couldn't even you know tell how much time was on the clock so i mean i got i, I basically they they 5v1 lebron james and won um so but in terms of bradley beal i think it would be you know like i would love to see bradley beal come to the celtics you know who, who wouldn't i mean the, he's a great player the problem is and this is the problem you know when we were talking about james harden earlier this season boston doesn't really have the ability to add a superstar to our current core of superstars we're in a position where we pretty much have to give up a star to get a star and brown and tatum you know like they're not tier one stars but neither is bradley beal and so now you're kind of you know like well you take away tier two star you add a tier two star we could talk about fit maybe but i mean both brown and tatum have a positional versatility that beal doesn't have they could both slot in at, at you know multiple positions Beal's really a pure shooting guard. He can play point guard, but he's definitely at his best as a shooting guard. So if he's on point guard, you have to run pick and roll sets, and we don't have a center who can really do pick and roll right now. 
So those are two issues with the fit right there. Now, um, you know, in terms of what could we trade for Beal, I actually think that you might get the Wizards interested if you centered a large package on Time Lord. Um, center is definitely a positional need for Washington, but we're not talking about like a Time Lord and some picks for Beal. We're talking like Time Lord, Smart, Naismith, or Langford plus a bunch of picks and maybe that would that would get the deal done and it's only because i think that the wizards do have a definite positional need at center assuming that they you know have moved on from thomas bryant i'm not really sure if they have or not um but i, I mean like i've never seen thomas bryant as being like a long-term center solution for anybody so um but a lot of that also depends how much do we feature time lord this year you know, if he keeps playing, you know, medium minutes and there's not really place for him, and he's not getting a lot of shots in the game, they're not going to be that interested in him. But if you give him the ball more, if we draw up plays that, you know, pick and roll plays, which we really should be trying to run with Walker because that's where Kemba Walker has traditionally been at his best. And now you're feeding Time Lord the ball and he's getting, you know, 10 shots. He converts at a high rate. We're looking at a guy who double doubles every night, who gets, you know, multiple blocks every night. Now, if you're a team that has a positional need at center and you're looking at a young big that's a nightly double double threat, you know, I'm, I'd be pretty interested. You know, like I, I, you know, if you brought up his name as the centerpiece, I'd say, you know, I'd say, okay, you know, like, let, let, let's talk about it. You know, let's see what we got. Um, but once again, that you know, the problem is there's Boston trades Time Lord. You know, we got to have a big positional need at center in that case, too. So Boston's in a really difficult position. We're not in a position like Brooklyn. Like Brooklyn was in this spot where they had managed their team and been lucky enough that they could add all these players. And, you know, that that was great. You know, that's great for them. And sometimes teams get lucky like that. Some And some of that was luck. I mean, I don't think anybody really thought James Harden was going to kind of Hulk smash his way out of Houston earlier this year. So I think that some of that's luck. And at that time, Brooklyn had the pieces. I mean, Levert's a nice piece. He's a good player. He's not a tier two star. He's really maybe a tier three star, you know, with a potential of maybe one day making an all-star team once or twice. But, you know, like if you're telling me, you know, like, do you trade Karis Levert and a bunch of picks for, you know, for James Harden? Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, of course I'd make that trade. You know, especially if I'm the Brooklyn Nets, because I don't even think they employ draft scouts anymore because they haven't had their own picks for years. So, I mean, it's not like, you know, it's not like it's anything new to Brooklyn. Brooklyn's like, oh, yeah, we don't like drafting anyway. That's that's why I take my vacation to the Caribbean. Come on, guys. But, um, but so, I mean, but it, Boston's not in that position because when you have to weigh giving up Jalen Brown or Jason Tatum, that's a much tougher question because now you're looking you're like, what's the potential? Like we all know Karis LeVert potential, like I said, maybe one or two all-star appearances in his career. Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, yo, know, you're looking for a possible perennial all-star. Tatum's case, maybe a top five, top six player in the league. Somebody who can contend for an MVP in several seasons. I mean, and that's a lot harder to trade away. And I, and I think that's where Boston struggles on some of these trade deals. And Ainge, I think, is hesitant to pull the trigger. He's always been very cautious with his trades. He doesn't want to lose a trade. And you definitely, no GM wants to be the GM who trades away a future MVP because, you know, let's face it, it's, it's not a good thing to put on your resume down the road. So I think all those things kind of combine together and making it very difficult for Beal to land in Boston via trade, maybe in free agency. Yeah. Him and Tatum are friends. Tatum and Kyrie Irving were also friends. And, you know, it, in case you haven't noticed, Kyrie did, I don't even think he waved goodbye on the way out of Boston. So, I mean, I, I don't, I mean, like the only thing he's really done coming back to Boston is burn incense and wave it around and expelled evil spirits or whatever it was he was doing there. So, I mean, like it's great that they're friends, but I don't feel like Tatum and Brown have that level of pull yet. It's not like LeBron. Like if LeBron comes to you and says, hey, you know, I think you could be a part of our championship team. It's like if Tom Brady comes to you in the NFL, you're like, oh, yeah, you know, you really think so? Yeah, let me let me go. You know, you're going to pay me minimum wage? That's fine. I'll, I'll take 750 or 726 an hour. We're good. You know, and when we look at guys like Cousins, Griffin, Aldridge, these are guys who want to get rings. They know that their careers are, you know, almost done. I mean, Cousins went to Golden State to get a ring, so I don't think it's surprising they went to a team that he thinks is going to contend for a ring. 
Um, he already tried it once. It didn't work out because, you know, the, the Warriors had like the worst championship run with injuries ever. And they did lost to the Raptors. But, you know, I'm not surprised. It went. I'm not surprised that Aldridge and Griffin decided to go to Brooklyn because, you know, like these guys are conscious about their legacy. And when you're at that stage in your career, you're thinking about what legacy am I going to leave in the NBA? You know, like how, how am I going to be remembered? And a part of that, you want to be remembered as a guy who had a championship ring. So I, and I just don't think Boston is close enough at this point. You know, we've seen some of the kind of, I, I would say, dysfunctional issues on the team with the lack of ball movement, the lack of trust, all the rumors swirling around the team about Stevens, the locker room, Smart, Brown, all this stuff. And for a veteran, if I'm a veteran player who's in the last couple of years of my career wanting to win a ring, I'm saying that like, dude, like, I'm, I'm not going to go there to fix the high school cafeteria. Are you kidding me? Like, I, I got done with that like two, three years ago. Um, and I think that's where Boston has trouble bringing these guys in. Like, you know, you don't hear about, you know, you don't hear about any, any young players having a problem with LeBron James, you know, or when you did in LA in his first year there, look how fast those young players got shipped out. I mean, they got shipped out so fast. I don't think the Lakers even knew where they shipped them to. They were just there, like, okay, LeBron don't want to like, here you guys go play tickets. Good luck. Um, and so, but I, I think that's Boston's issue. It's like these stars look at it. And it's like, yeah, it's a talented team, but there's all these, you know, this, these rumors about these issues here. Like, is that really where I want to go and spend the last two years of my career? And so I think that's where Boston's at in terms of trade deals and getting these veteran players. I think it's going to be really tough. Uh, Andy, uh, first of all, we want to uh, say hello to Nicola Borgani from Ita Italy, uh, Celtics uh, Nation uh, uh, Italia. I was previous on their chats and uh, he wants to say hi to all the guys. He is the friend of the program and hi to all Italian guys. They are the strong fan bases in Europe and the best guys. Uh, we will have uh, Nicola soon on our show and we will have uh, hopefully the guys, the guy from uh, their show here on Celtics Talk Radio. Uh, Andy is gone, uh, but uh, 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 if um, Andy, uh, the questions from Joseph for you. Uh, if we trade Time Lord, who is going to 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 uh, play center for us? If I'm correct, and is there any way chance to get Horford back the next season? Uh, if I must say, why would we trade Time Lord? I mean, I, I, I don't I don't know why, you know, uh, I don't get uh, to the uh, to, to my mind. I would not trade Time Lord. What about you, Andy? Yeah, so I'm not saying that we should trade Time Lord. I'm saying that that is a package that might interest a team like Washington that has a positional need for center. And if we wanted to trade for Bradley Beal, that would be an option where we could trade for him without giving up Brown or Tatum. Um, if we were to trade Time Lord, yeah, we we'd kind of be up up a creek without a paddle at the center position. We don't have we don't have a really long term solution there. And you know that's a point at which you'd have to start looking at you know what veteran centers can you sign, and you probably have to do some sort of you know like a center by committee type proposition. You know, you know, you know, it, you know this is all hypothetical, but hypothetically you might center trade for Time Lord and you would include like say Robin Lopez with Bradley Beal. And that would give you like a 20 minutes at center and then you have to figure out the other 25 minutes as you go. Um it definitely wouldn't be ideal. I don't want to see us trade Time Lord unless we're getting a superstar player in return. Um and the reason you know like it's very hard to find young bigs with upside in the NBA. It's just, you know, it's a very difficult position to play now. To find a young big that has his athleticism and the playmaking that we've seen, it is very difficult to find a good playmaking big whose playmaking is more than just handing the ball off at the top of the key. You know, and Time Lord could actually pass. And I think that's too valuable to give him up unless you're getting, you know, like a high tier B or a tier A superstar in return for it. Um, in terms of Horford, I think we might be able to get him back, but I think the problem with trying to get him back is if we get him back, it's probably because other teams aren't that interested in him at this point in his career. Um, there's a lot of things I'd like about Al Horford. I, I was always a Horford fan. I thought he was incredibly versatile. He was very workmanlike. He was a professional in pretty much every way you could ask a player to be a professional. 
But he's also, I think, what, 32 or 33 now? I think he's like 33. He might be 33 by the end of the season. And that's that's very old for a big man. And the chances of him being able to make a meaningful contribution at that age are pretty low. Now, if you want to bring him back, you know, maybe he plays, you know, a 15 minute per game guy or 15 minutes every other night, uh, you know, like close to a vet minimum. And he is there to kind of mentor Time Lord and these young guys and kind of be that stabilizing presence in the locker room. You know, yeah, I'm all for that. I, th- I think that would be great on a, cl- a vet minimum or close to a vet minimum. I'd probably even pay like what we paid Daniel Tice, to be honest, uh, because of all the different things Horford brings to a team. But I don't think that he would be any sort of a solution at the center position. He would be somebody that you're bringing in to play, you know, 15 minutes per night, maybe, you know, every now and then, maybe 20 minutes situationally if he's feeling good, um, and to mentor the young players. And in that role, I think he'd be very good. Um, And, um, of course, happy Easter, like uh, to all the Celtics fans from all of us. And happy Easter to you guys, uh, to Nikola Bogani, to Joseph Sforza, to everybody. Um, I mean, from Celtic Stock Radio crew. Uh, uh, Kevin, uh, I have statistics for you. I have statistics for you, you know, because, you know, I mean, uh, I don't want to prize myself, but I'm possessing the Celtic statistics that my friend da- uh, Davor Vitkovic gave me. I mean, the Celtic statistic that I, I, I don't know if Sean Grandi is having the statistic that I am having, <laughs> but never mind. You know, you know that I am maniac about it. Uh, anyway, uh, he, he said um, about Al Horford contracts, uh, Nikola Bogdani, he can be bought out, Cor- Cor- uh, Horford. Um, he has another guaranteed uh, year, Al Horford in Oklahoma. Joseph added, uh, Horford would be main backup. Uh, I I think that he can be waived from Oklahoma if they don't count on him, or he can be stretched. You know, there is an option, for example, if you have uh, 20 million left one year, then you stretch the guy in five years, and, and this is going towards your cap four years, uh, four millions the next five years. So they can use the stretch provision on 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 Al Horford, for example, Oklahoma, or they can waive him. But let's let's see what Oklahoma will do. Uh, Kevin, your questions: net rating, offensive rating, and defensive rating of the NBA champions. I don't have informations. Uh, I can find it, but now never mind. It's easy to draw the conclusion. Since 2000 until 2019, listen to this. So Los Angeles Lakers, 2000. Uh, they were fifth in offense, offensive rating, first in defensive rating. Of course, Shaquille O'Neal. And net rating, this is the most important, net rating, top three net rating. They were first in net rating championship. Now, the next season, 2001, uh, listen to this. They were first in the offensive rate ranking, uh, Kobe Bryant and Shaquille O'Neal. They were 22nd in defensive ranking. 22nd. I cannot remember who was opponent 2001. Uh, it could be uh, San Antonio, if I'm correct, but I could check. Uh, uh, not San Antonio, uh, at, at, at the East, from the Eastern Conference, it, it, uh, or uh, Brooklyn, uh, or, I mean, New Jersey Nets, but uh, 22nd in the defensive rating, Kevin. And they won the championship like... Um, uh, uh, net rating eight, but this is one exception. Okay, so the next season they were Lakers second in the offensive rating, 2000 uh, in two second offensive rating and defensive rating seventh. So net rating second. So you see the pattern: the top three in net rating. The 2003, the Spurs. The Spurs were 2003 eight in offensive rating. But in the defensive rating, they were third. And overall, they were third in the net rating. So net rating and point differential is good uh, pointer towards the finals and the champion. Uh, 2004, defensive uh, Pistons, listen to this, listen to this. Offensive rating, Pistons were 19th. They were minus 10 compared to the... Uh, points allowed and points scored, minus 10.9. Net rating, 
19th in the offensive rating and the second in the defensive rating. So second in the defensive rating, overall net rating second. And that's why they won the championship, the defense. San Antonio Spurs, 2005, eighth in the offensive rating, first in the defensive rating, first in the net rating. So they won the championship. Miami Heat, 2006, uh, Shaquille O'Neal, Dwayne Wade, they were seventh in the offensive rating and 10th in the defensive rating. Yet, top 10 in both offense and the defense, um, and six in the net rating. One, uh, one uh, exception from the rule. San Antonio Spurs, uh, uh, that's by Kendry, but never mind. Hope that you can hear me. Uh, he's awake. Uh, 2007, the Spurs, five offensive rating, second defensive rating. So first in the net rating. Boston Celtics 2008, listen to this. We were 11th in the offensive rating. We were also minus 10 guys uh, comparing points scored and points allowed. But, but guess what? We were first in the defensive rating 2008 and we were first in the net rating. And the net rating is the best pointer towards the champions. Los Angeles Lakers 2009, uh, they were third of offense, six defense, third net rating. Now, uh, 2010 is uh, another exception. 11th in the offense, Los Angeles Lakers, third in the defense again, six in the net rating. Uh, now, the strangest champion, uh, probably Dallas Mavericks, 2011. Ninth in the defense, in the offense, uh, eight in the defense, eight in the net rating, but still top 10 in the offense and defense and eight in the net rating. Miami Heat 2012, sixth offense, four defense, third net rating, champions, um, uh, but uh, top six defense and offense. 2013, the first in offense, ninth in defense, but second in the net rating. So 2014, uh, f five in, in five, fifth in offense, uh, fourth in defense, first in net rating. Golden State Warriors, we are getting to Golden State. Listen, Andy, uh, 2015, first title, second in offense, first in defense, uh, first in net rating. They killed 2015. But the next year, what happened? The third in offense, 10th in defense, and fourth in net rating. They are sliding in the defense uh, but 2017 they killed it first in in, def, in offense second in defense and first in net rate rating okay so everybody that is saying that they were simply offensive team they are wrong but last championship 2018 third in offense 11th in defense that's what i thought 11th in defense 2018 but third in the net rating overall and final statistic that I possess is uh, Raptors 2019, uh, fifth in offense, uh, fifth in defense, third in net rating. Uh, what does that mean overall uh, from 2000, 2019, like 19, 20 years sample size? So uh, over the last 20 season, um, you know, um, the teams were usually top three in net rating. Only examples were 2015-16 Cleveland Cavaliers, 2011 Mavericks, 2010 Lakers, 6 Heat, and 2001 uh, Lakers. So the one thing in common with all these teams, they each had a um, um, uh, great on the roster, the top uh, uh, 10 or top 25 players of all the time, LeBron James, Dirk Nowitzki, uh, Kobe Bryant, uh, uh, Dwayne Wade, Shaquille O'Neal, uh, or, uh, uh, you know, uh, twin, 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 twin brothers in San Antonio, you know. So um, uh, they changed the mathematics. Duncan, Robinson, Wade, Shaquille O'Neal, Kobe Bryant, uh, James Nowitzki. So um, uh, last uh, information, uh, you know, uh, does defense wins the championship? The quality of the team's defense heavily influence ability to win the games and championship. But certain aspects of the defense are more important than the others. The statistics is showing. In particular, teams 
hoping to win the title, should focus more on minimizing opponents' points total and field goal percentage, and less to forcing turnovers and secondary defensive rebounds. I repeat, they should be focused on minimizing opponents' total points and field goal percentage to minimize it, and less on the turnovers and securing defensive rebounds. You know, uh, so uh, that's it. I could go on and on, but it's not one man show. Uh, Kevin, hope to satisfy your curiosity. Yes, it did. I, I, I just, I just, I was just wondering. Um, <clears throat> but this goes to show you that, that, um, like I said before, offense gets you to the championship, but defense wins it for you. And as we see now, that in the NBA, um, there's very minimum defense being played. That's why I don't understand how these guys look so tired, because it don't take much to shoot the ball. When it comes to Celtics, I mean, because that's all that's all we do is shoot. We don't go for layups. That game against Houston, I mean, that game against uh, Dallas, I think it was. Um, I don't think we shot. I don't think we made. A, I don't think we shot a layup the whole game. I don't think so. I think we shot jump shots the whole game. You know what I'm saying? So, um, that was pathetic. You know what I'm saying? Just pathetic. So. Thank you for your information, man. I appreciate that. We yeah, can I, say, I, say I agree with Kev. I mean, I, I think that, you know, that's a big problem is not doing layups, not dunking. Um, even when we do go in, I don't know. Am I the only one who knows this? Like, we go in and we have a good lane to make a layup. And instead of doing a layup, they do like a floater, which is an exponentially more difficult shot. Like, am I the only one who's noticed that, or, or like, is it just me, or does it feel like you know, like we're not even, even when we get close, we're, we're like, oh, you know, like I could do a layup, I could dunk it, let me do a floater because you know because whatever. I mean, I, I, I personally think it's just that the team is soft. I think they're afraid of contact, and I think we see that in the perimeter defense. I've said that be this before on, on the show too. Is when you look at them, they don't go for contact. They actively try to avoid situations where you have contact with people and that 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 won't help you succeed in any sport any professional sport whether you're talking football soccer anything else it's crazy to me it's crazy to me i've never seen pro athletes who are this adverse to getting physical and giving and receiving contact okay we have from chris venice and by the way, uh, Mr. Chris, thanks for uh, interacting with us. Uh, we are doing all for you, of course. Uh, what are the chances you think Tatum and Brown leave Boston after their current contracts uh, up? I think it's strong possibility with how the things are trending. Uh, I have been talking this since 2018, and the people are telling that I'm the hater, I'm negative guy, and everything else. Danny is saying the same. Kevin is saying the same, and he's Kevin saying the same. We, we are not saying that this is going to happen. We are saying that nothing is certain in the NBA. The Celtics fans, usually, majority of them, they act like Tatum and Brown, they signed the lifelong contract with Boston, and they will stay no matter what happens in Boston. Sadly, the things are not going that way uh, in the NBA. Again, in the NBA, it's trend to have the short contracts and you know um the superstars to team up uh, in the destinations that are uh free agency good destinations like los angeles like miami like brooklyn you know um, and new york would be that destination if they don't have uh, the idiot for the owner you know but um uh, so they they agree outside of the court uh, like Kyrie and Kevin Durant, you know, we want to play somewhere else. And then you see the announcement. Now, what about Tatum and Brown? Uh, if Boston uh, allows Tatum and Brown to compete for the championship, that means to form the team around them. And this is not this team. This team is not formed that way. Uh, if they uh, form the team to maximize Tatum and Brown talent, uh, the, the ceiling of the team to depend on Tatum and Brown's ceiling 
and they to have the supporting cast that they like. And I don't think that they like the supporting cast on this team, to tell you the truth. This is part of the problems. Uh, if Boston restructures, you know, if we are here, top five teams every year, at least third round, Eastern Conference finals and finals, I think that they will resign. But if we change the teams every single year, you know, and for example, one year, this guy, another year, this guy, one year we change the core, another year we dump smart for the salary uh, dump move. And if we are bad, you know, if we are uh, if we are number eight, number six, second round, third round, they will say, listen, the Boston is changing too much every year and we cannot maximize our potential here. We are going to go to somewhere, some, somewhere else, Los Angeles, you know, New York. It's, it's, it's extremely possible. That's why I think that... Um, we must restructure and trading Kemba Walker uh, would be one of uh, the thing. Uh, we talk about Bradley Beal, you know, um, again, uh, uh, you you must fo form the supporting ca cast for them. Maybe to sacrifice Kemba Walker and to form the supporting cast uh, 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 to, to, to them. Maybe they to, to recruit Bradley Beal, I don't know, but uh, that is possibility, Chris. You are totally right. Kevin, you want to answer on this? Um, I, I agree with I agree with everything you're saying right there. Um I I I, I think Tatum stay I mean I think Brown will probably stay quicker than Tatum. Um and I think the reason why is because he's he has a point to prove that. When he got drafted, he felt like he should have been higher. Um, and he's, 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 he's vastly improved every year. Okay. So we're talking now that they're, they're soft. Okay. They don't want contact. So I guess that comes as a maturity level. So next year they look at, they look at what they did this year and they say, Brad, 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 um, Brad Stevens goes to himself. Okay. What do you need to improve on next year? And they say, I need to get to the basketball. Okay, so that means you're gonna get you're gonna get tagged a couple times, you're gonna get fouled, you're gonna your bun's gonna get sore, your back gonna be sore, but you're gonna get to line a whole lot. Um, so I guess if you wanna look at from that point of point of view, maybe that's a learning process for them to go through that next year. But I would say I would bet all you guys paycheck. Now I wouldn't bet mine, but I bet y'all paycheck that um that that uh, Brown will stay before Jason does because Jason has has been given everything, um, and he's been, um, you know, he's a he has a Kobe mentality. Um, I'm not saying he would go to Los Angeles, but <clears throat> I can see him going somewhere else, and they tell him they're gonna build the team around him um, because he has that mentality. But you know, e even though even though if <laughs> <laughs> even if he wasn't, even if he wasn't a Celtic, and he was a player in the NBA, I, if I was him, I, I would stay and deal with the ups and downs because when you do win that title, it's gonna be well worth it. You know, if you leave to 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 buddy up with somebody else, it doesn't have the same satisfaction as if you got there on your own. You know, now they've been to the mountaintop a few times and they haven't got to the top of the mountain. You know what I'm saying? So they know what it feels like to get to the Eastern Conference Finals, but they don't know what it is to get to the Finals. So, again, like I always said before, I think they need to feel pain before they can feel happiness as far as them winning a title. And I think if they don't make the playoffs this year, this is the year that they're going, their feet going to be held to the fire. Um, and they're going to say, okay, now it's time for you to stay. We understand the whole situation, COVID, the short season, the whole nine yards. So, Look like this season is going to end on end when it ends, and it's going to start on time. So we're telling you now, we need to see a better you than we've seen last year. We need to see a better teammate in you than we've seen last year. Um, if not, then we got to move on from you, you know, because Danny Ainge's job is to win titles. And if you're not up to doing that, then he got to trade you, you know. And our fans need to understand this. I think some fans do, some fans don't. But that's his job, and it, it in heart is. I mean, 
hard as hard it is hard it is to be realistic about it, that's his job is to put the best team on the court that can get banner number eighteen. And if that means moving Tatum or Brown to do it, he has no problem doing. As long as he gets something back, that's going to be like Andy said, like a superstar. You know, what I'm saying they are all stars, but they're not superstars. You know, so um, again, I think Jason Tatum would be the one if 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 there was somebody that would would move um, on their own, it would be Jason Tatum. I think Brown stays. Um, I think you 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 could see. Brown being a being a Paul Pierce type of guy, if they don't win a title, he's gonna be like, okay, I'm gonna give you so many, I'm gonna give you this, I'm gonna give you time. If you don't get it together, then you gotta trade me, you know. Then this is less of up to Danny to do the Kevin Garnett Paul Pierce thing again. Uh, I will mention when you say before giving word to Danny and Andy to answer the question about uh, that Chris asked. Uh, 2006, when we had a horrible year, I cannot remember, 22, 25 wins, something like that, you know, lottery team. Uh, I think that uh, Paul Pierce uh, said uh, later that he went to, to Vic Grausbeck and he said that um, if the team uh, continues in this direction, he wanted uh, to be traded, you know, and Vic Grausbeck promised him that uh, the team will do everything to make... Uh, uh, Boston competitive for the title, then they uh, made those two trades, you know. So, um, I mean, we, we don't know what would happen, uh, but uh, uh, Pierce told, if you guys want to suck, you know, it's okay to me, but uh, get me out of here, you know. So, uh, stars don't want to rebuild. That's my point, you know. Uh, Danny? <coughs> Well, I got to agree with, you know, one thing that Kev said that I do believe that if you had to look at the two of them and say which one is likely to stay longer, I believe it would be Brown over Tatum at this point. Uh, I don't think you can uh, overlook the potential that Jason Tatum could potentially look towards the Los Angeles market, knowing the impact that Kobe Bryant had over Jason Tatum's, you know, life, especially now with how you know, uh, you know, everything ended for Kobe Bryant, you know, with, uh, you know, the airplane, you know, situation and all that, the way his uh, life ended overall. Something like that, you know, plays a, can play a major role in the, you know, life of a young person, you know, in terms of someone who's, whose age is, you know, the age of Tatum. Think about it. Just look at the way, the, the way we are, looking at someone who, the players we used to watch when we were younger in this case, you know. Think about the Jordans, for example, when we were watching him on the court. You don't think if we were on the court right now, we had, if we had a chance to say if Jordan was our very best, when we were, you know, our very, very favorite player, if we had a chance to play for the Chicago Bulls and try to basically, you know, be the number one guy pretending to be Jordan with that ball in hand, we wouldn't take it? Of course we would. You know? So... Yes, Tatum, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't think Tatum would actually jump at the opportunity to possibly be the number one guy on the Los Angeles Lakers, making the most money in basically, you know, one of the top the top markets in the in, you know in the country, you know, playing for one of the two most historic franchises in the leagues, obviously we all know when it comes to which you know franchise is the most historic. Right now we all know it's a tie between the Lakers and the Celtics because obviously the titles is what basically determines that. And at this point, we're now tied with the Lakers. That could all end at the end of this season if the Lakers, for some reason, end up winning it all. And that basically means we can no longer say we got that title of being the most disturbed. Unfortunately, as much as I hate to say it, you know, we got to be fair because we've been using that excuse of we've got the most championships and so we're the most historic. Most historic all these years against them. So let's just, you know, fair is fair, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen. I hate to say it, but fair is fair, you know. So if you don't think the impact of being able to follow in Kobe's footsteps actually won't play a role in the mind of Jason Tatum once his contract is up, you know, in a couple of years, then obviously you're smoking something and you're not, you're just not thinking straight, you know. Jalen Brown, on the other hand, in this situation, 
I do think he would be willing to stay long term in Boston, especially if he feels things are heading in the right direction. But mark, mark my words in this situation. We, you know, this this this, this is just a general sports things you sports thing, you guys. It's, you know, look at look at the NFL with the Patriots and Tom Brady for a good example. What's the best way of basically keeping your superstars with you? Just give them whatever the heck they want. If you know the player is worth it, give them whatever the heck they want and let them stay you know happy, and they'll stay with you. Well, as long as as long as basically you can keep them. That's one of the reasons I say that Tom Brady is now gone. That basically the Patriots didn't give him what he wanted when it came to the right players, the money situation and all that, and he walked away. And now he's a champion somewhere else. When it came to the situation with, you know, the players for the Celtics, regardless of who you are in terms of whether you sided with the issue of Kyrie, Horford, Hayward, and the veterans versus, you know, Tatum, Brown, and Rozier, if the Celtics really wanted, you know, Kyrie and all of them, what did you have to do? You had to give those guys what they wanted, which was to get rid of the young players and get them some more veteran talent to replace them. And in this case, if you would have done that, you would have gotten them the guys they wanted, and those guys would have still been here right now instead of Kyrie playing for Brooklyn and us looking like we're possibly likely to be on the outside of the playoffs rather than being on the inside of the playoffs in just a month and a half from now. So I'm simply saying, you guys, if it comes to that point that we got to look at a situation of, okay, Brown is on the edge possibly of wanting to leave or staying, us, staying with us, if you know there's a player out there somewhere from any other team that might be able to basically keep him with us, I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's Marcus Smart. I don't care if it's Tom Brown. I don't care if it's Danny Angel's son himself. You take that, 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 that person and you trade them behind in order to get Jalen Brown who he wants to get him over here. You get that player that Jalen Brown wants in order to get that that contract signed, in order for Jalen Brown to stay here long term. At that point, because if at that point you let him walk away, then what the heck was all this for? What was the point of siding with Tatum and Brown and Rozier against people like Kyrie, Hartford, Maris, and the rest of the veterans, and letting those guys walk away and making the claims that our future was more bright with these players than, than we were with those veterans who were already established stars just to see them walk away because you're not willing to make the sacrifices to get these guys the assets or the players they want to play with in order to keep them happy. Why do you think LeBron, everywhere he goes, again, it's easy to get him the guys he wants. I understand that because players who he wants to play with come running like crazy and take massive pay cuts in this situation. That I understand, but you don't ever see another team hesitate to go and get the player LeBron James wants or that Kevin Durant wants or that Steph Curry wants. We're in the same situation, you guys. We're in a massive, we're in a market that doesn't get much attention, doesn't get, you know, many players to want to come. So when you do have superstars that you think could be, you know, future, you know, top five players, you do whatever you can to hold on to them. You do not risk losing them for any other reason other than the fact that you feel that you got no choice because there's no way financially you can do it. But if there is a way to basically get the job done, you do it at that point. I don't care what you got to give up. But I do think Brown will stay here long term. Tatum, on the other hand, I think he can be as good as gone if we basically don't make the NBA Finals by the end of his next contract. Um, Andy, uh, finally you, to finish with uh, the question from Chris Venice. What are the chances you think Tatum and Brown to leave Boston after their current contracts are uh, up? He thinks that it's strong possibility Tatum and Brown walks away. How the things are going and trending in Boston? Yeah, so I, I think first of all, it's very hard to say because there's so much that happens behind the scenes. Like, so one of the reasons that they made those trades for Ray Allen and Kevin Garnett is that Doc Rivers had a really good feel on you know, the pulse with Paul Pierce, right? And he went to, and this, you know, this has been documented in several different stories by insiders who wrote books about, 
how that championship team came together. Um, Doc went to Danny Ainge and said, you know, like, this is probably our last year with Paul before he checks out. Like, if we don't make progress this year, he's gone. And so Ainge understood that and went out and made those, you know, those trades to get Ray Allen and to get Kevin Garnett. Now, I think one thing to be concerned about is I'm not convinced that uh, Brad Stevens really has that good of a feel for the pulse of these players. Like, I, I don't like Doc is a guy that we all know his reputation across the NBA is as a player's coach. You know, and his ability to build connection with players, I think really it's him and Steve Kerr when you talk about coaches who can connect with players on that level. Um, and I don't think Stevens has that. So the danger, I think, here is that we miss that pulse and Tatum checks out. You know, like, well, we're not going anywhere, so I'm gone. And we don't catch it in time to have a realistic chance of doing, you know, of making a move. The other thing that I'm actually, you know, kind of, I wouldn't say concerned, but I find a little bit interesting in that regard is the statement that Tatum made regarding them trading Javante Green. Um, and I never knew that Green and Tatum were friends, but apparently they were pretty good friends. And what struck me wasn't the fact that they traded Green because, you know, like, you know he's a bench guy. He's deep, deep bench. He's very expendable. But what kind of struck me was that Tatum, it seemed like he really got blindsided by this. Like the organization didn't say anything to him. He just kind of felt almost like he found out what we found out. And if you want to keep a superstar talent, you can't trade off his best or one of his best friends on the team and not tell him and let him find out from the national media. Like that's, that's not a good look because that goes to the loyalty side and you know, and loyalty goes both ways. You know, like players should be loyal to the franchise, but the franchise has to be loyal too. And to me, if I'm a player and you tell me like, oh, well, we'd like for you to be loyal to the franchise. And I'm saying that like, you traded off like my two best friends and didn't even, like, didn't even let me know. Didn't even send me a tweet about it. Like, you know, why should I feel loyalty to you? You know, and that's something I think that you have to be careful of. I don't go quite as far as like Daniel does with saying that we need to trade for the players they want. But if you're not going to do that, then you have to win. You have to get results. At the end of the day, you know, it's that old saying in sports, winning solves everything. It's not always true, but for the most part, that is true. Like people deal, you know, Brady, Brady and Belichick never really got along. They had a professional relationship, but they did not like each other personally but they got along because they had so much success and people would come to new england and put up with things that you wouldn't put up with anywhere else because if you played at the new england patriots you basically had a 50 percent chance of playing in the championship game every year so players are willing to give up quite a bit for that type of an opportunity you know same way players will go play with lebron because you know you have a really good chance of being in the finals if you're on lebron's team so yeah, you know, I'll make a lot of sacrifices for that. Uh, Boston's not in that position. So kind of back to what Daniel said, you don't have to trade for the players they want, but if you trade for a different player, that player better work out and advance the team. Because if they don't, then, you know, then your superstar is going to sit there like, well, you know, if you trade for the guy I wanted, then, you know, we'd be at the finals. Now, maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. You know, you, you know I'm not a big what-if scenario person because I think you could go down a million – rabbit holes doing that but you know that's what goes through the player's head and that just kind of adds you know it's one of those things it's not any one you know it's never really one thing that makes a player want to leave a franchise it's the culmination of all these small things you know you traded off one of my friends without telling me you didn't get the player that i wanted to you to and then the guy you did get sucked you know the coach doesn't really have a feel for, you know, for my pulse and how I feel about the team. We're not going anywhere. And none of those things individually would make a player leave necessarily. But when you add all of that together, you know, it's kind of like when you go to leave your job, you know, when any of us goes to leave our job, you know, we're not, usually we're not leaving because of one thing. We're usually leaving because of a bunch of different things that kind of snowball into one big feeling of dissatisfaction that makes us, you know, hey, screw this, I'm out. You know? And I think players are kind of the same way. And we have to be careful with Tatum and Brown because right now there are a lot of things like, you know, the chemistry questions 
the you know the talent questions on the roster. You know, can Brad Stevens really coach a championship level team? Trading people off like they're spare parts, and all these things will kind you know can add up very very quickly and weigh on players. And you don't necessarily because they're all small things. You don't necessarily see it. It's not like there's some you know like epiphany come to Jesus moment where the player you know, loses, you know, loses their mind on the sidelines or something. It's just these things that build up and, you know, by the time their contract's coming up, it's like, well, you know, hey, maybe, maybe I do want to go try playing in LA or maybe I do want to go try playing in Phoenix or maybe I would, you know, maybe, maybe things would be easier if I'm playing with a guy like Luca down in Dallas, you know, and that's where you lose a player because I can tell you right now with these, with Brown Tatum, when they're up for contracts, LA is probably going to be looking for people. The Mavericks are probably going to be looking for somebody to put next to Luca. There's going to be a lot of very attractive spots to land. And Boston, if we aren't careful, we're going to be in that category of okay, but not great. And when there are great spots to land at, you know, if you're the okay spot, you're probably going to lose. Okay, guys, um, I wanted to. Now we can end the chat if you want, or uh, I have the article, and it would be um, very interesting what we can say for the show. Ran Bernardoni um, perspectives and uh, judging Evan Fournier trade and look into the future and outcomes. He is the cap expert that we played. So, uh, Daniel, do you want to go with the article, or we want to end the chat because it's eight. Uh, we can finish uh, the show with that article, Igor. So we'll go with the article. And then okay. okay, okay. Then we will comment. It is really interesting and really important, guys. Uh, so he said this. Um, the Celtics traded for Evan Fournier. I didn't like it, and I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know uh, that this will not work out. Um, there are certain ways that it could work out, um, but uh, I simply be believe that the upside is limited and relatively unlikely to be borne out. Downside is significantly more likely. The good outcomes. So this is how the good out outcome will be. Uh, my primary problem with acquisition of Fournier is expiring contract. If the team were in serious title contention, that would be fine. So we can start there. I was highly uh, likely on uh, this team at the beginning of the season, expected slow start and to pick up. It's possible that uh, the uh, contending level team is still lurking beneath the surface, uh, surface waiting for uh, recoveries from COVID and injuries to play out. Um, if uh, the contender emerges, that's obviously added, adding a player like Fournier for low price, two picks will look great. They are added, uh, they are added by easy uh, schedule and many teams um, suffering insignificant injuries and limits on number of fans, possibly diminishing the value of home court advantage. So on the other side um, on a, of uh, the expiring non-contender equation, uh, Fournier is extension eligible. So there has been no indication that this is coming. But if he surprises everybody and inks 2 million, 30 million two year, 30 million extension or, or 15 million per year extension, then Boston Celtics would have traded tiny price for exact type of contracts that they need to add. So my opinion of the deal would be positive. More, most likely Fournier goes to the free agency. It is possible that he plays well enough for the Celtics to want him back, um, but uh, that major offers for him don't materialize. If the team cannot retain him on the team-friendly contract, uh, that would also be good. I think that the number would still be um, uh, uh, would still not be higher than three million forty-five, three years forty-five millions, or fifteen millions per year. But this contract is not likely. Uh, if ownership is willing to pay 50 plus million tax bill for the foreseeable future, it's much more easier to uh, digest the trade. I won't believe uh, that huge tax paying until I actually see it. Um, and this is not correct in my opinion. This is upside of Fournier 
Um, now, complicated se se semi-positives. I would also consider good outcome if the team uses the remaining TPE to acquire a player in specific way uh, while Fournier leaves free agency. For example, Larry Nance is a player I thought is a good trade for the reminder of the TPE. Uh, other possibilities, Maxi Kleber, etc. It's possible that the team tries to trade for Larry Nance and we're told uh, he would cost two first rounders. To do that now, the team would have to protect their picks this year and the uh, 2013 year also protected with both possibility rolling forward. That could limit their pick uh, trade options for years to come. However, if they make that trade uh, for Larry Nance at the draft, they could make the 2021 first pick for Cleveland and then send that player from 2021 draft with their 2022nd pick on the top for Larry Nance to Cleveland. It is possible that Nance's uh, price come down to fever playoff runs of his deals and can be picked up for the player um, uh, and single pick. But doing that, they will likely be using entire TPE, uh, which uh, is not going to end the world due to probable budget, budget constructions uh, to functionally acquire a, a hybrid of Fournier for a year and uh, Nance for two years um, uh, in a way that uh, expanded slightly more draft capital, but in more beneficial manner. This is less ideal than just trading for Nance now, uh, depending on how much the price drops, because part of value is doing that trade uh, a possibility of retrading him this offseason as part of larger acquisition. But in total, it will be amount to positive outcome because of how much smaller opportunity costs uh, have been for the rest of TPE and budget space. He's talking about Larry Nance potential trade. Uh, things that will be um, sold as good outcomes, but they are not. Winning enough games to get into number four, number five series and winning one round on the playoff is not positive outcome if Fournier then leaves in the free agency. I repeat, if we win the first round as potential number four or five seeds and Fournier leaves in the free agency, this is bad outcome. Fournier leaving and the team turning it into TPE, generating side and trade, is not a good outcome either. The bad outcomes. If Fournier walks away in the free agency um, and the team makes it to try anything less than the conference finals, it was then waste of time carrying carried opportunity costs, less than anything conference finals. I didn't expect it Hayward TPE to turn into anything amazing if it went to the off season, but it's possible that it could be important part of trading Kemba Walker out, TPE, if the team decides that is the right way forward. Hypothetically, if they moved Kemba Walker to LA, Clip, uh, Clip, Clippers for Patrick Beverly, Luke Kennard, and Teres Mann, those players who go into Haver TPE, immediately creating a new TPE for all the Walker salary. That could then be used this TPE from Walker um, to, um, with all the Celtics picks, 2021-23, um, into distant future for somebody for Bradley Beal. Okay, so you create the TPE and add the picks and then trade that for Bradley Beal with one young player. That team would be enormously expensive without other parts moving around, but it greases the skid on the bigger moves because you can combine TPEs, you can combine the exceptions. A set of medium-sized traded player exceptions are not nearly as helpful in achieving that type of goal. Also possible, it could have been used to pick up Harrison Barnes type, who I think causes some budget questions to be asked, but is better fit on the team. A more likely bad outcome is simply put Fournier to reside in overpriced contract, three years, 60 millions, I'm afraid. When Kyrie Irving left the team, signed a worse face mill in Walker to uh, what quickly um, be, became a bad contract. So um, 
Th that could be repeating in slow motion, watching Gordon Hayward leaving, and then be replaced by worse pace mill, who eventually signs with a bad value. Let's say that Fournier signs four years, 80 million extension. That contract will immediately be used as best neutral value. There is minimal room for it exceed his debt, but large downside. The league is structured to force overpaying the guys, upper mid mid class guys like Evan Fournier, Bogdan Bogdanovic from Utah, etc. Uh, Bogdan Bogdanovic from Atlanta uh, or Boyan Bogdanovic from Utah. Uh, upper mid class. On the top of that, unless the team has significantly larger budget than 10 million stocks maximum, it would be cascade down to other cost cutting moves. In shortly, uh, signing Fournier four years, 80 million would cost us. We will be forced to cut Marcus Mart or Kemba Walker for tax saving move similar to Daniel Tice. We can set up the contract with 8% annual rises and starting for 17.9 million in 2021-22. So if Jason Tatum doesn't make All-Star this year, Boston picks his 20th in the draft, then it fills out the roster with veteran minimum contracts. They would be projected the next year, 2001-2. 44 million tax bills with Fournier extension four years, 20 million. So um, this is uh, this is not likely the Celtics to pay that cap, that cap and that tax. Did co this could be came down to cutting uh, Tristan Thompson um, uh, for little or no salary, but it goes trading back and out uh, of the last two draft picks, uh, like uh, moving Aaron Baines on Innis Cantor. The Celtics don't have extra picks now, and Thompson makes more uh, than either of them. So um, what is the team going to give up now to get off the bad money? Even if they do that, they will then have to add some spending back to have viable center rotations. Through all of this, we also still haven't resolved the problem of not having the additional big wing uh, the team required to contend. Ask yourself question. If the Celtics ownership group um, is spending a record um, you know, uh, money tax. Uh, the team to be in the middle of the Eastern Conference standings and that uh, no one really believes they are the contenders. If the answer is no, it means either Fournier is not re-signed or probably Smart or Walker are gone. If it's Smart gone, then the trade is Smart for Fournier. If it's Walker, we are going to have to spend draft capital to um, uh, clear Walker's money. Uh, while Fournier may be better fit on this team than Walker, it's hard to argue that he has higher ceiling as a player than Walker. I would classify this bad outcome as most likely outcomes. The team plays better for the rest of the season, uh, added easy schedule, eliminated round one on two. Fournier resigns, um, you know, uh, for at least what he's making now, three or four years bad contract. And now either Smart or Walker is traded because of the uh, cost cutting move. Um, and Fournier plays well enough to be an Albatross contract, but not as well to be uh, established as major value. The reminder of Jalen Brown's cur cur current deal plays out with the team constructed in financial blind and never quite good enough to contend uh, and uh, with enough assets to get it uh, on the best trade targets, short of offering Brown himself. And there are other opportunities uh, to win now. Uh, you know, he mentioned Larry Nance uh, going after um, Gordon. If Ainge isn't delivered, uh, that the opportunity is down, uh, he can uh, settle down and reset 2021 or 2021 on 23rd. Uh, you know, um, to build back up before these contracts Brown and Tatum are done. Um, and it would be painful, but trading smart for future assets would be part of that conversation. Uh, trading ties for some kind of future assets of instead of just cashing in a big grouse back pocket would be certainly better plan. If that's were not feasible, then getting off 
Thompson or Walker is good while we have options. Also, small tanking would be consideration. It might not be possible uh, to do effectively with an easy schedule, but uh, there is reality of the weirdness of the COVID situation. And, um, you know, uh, because draft class is uh, pay, uh, packed, so doing that two years from now might have been serious impact of the next contract decisions to Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum. But does anyone really believe that the half of the season of the three years in advance of those decisions would be deciding factor uh, in what they will do? Do you think Toronto is crying about the lost season, knowing that the currently they have 32% of landing top four picks and will be resetting the next year with at least Siakam, Van Vliet and Anunobi? So what the front office uh, have to do? The decisions. The problem is that the clock is running down. Making the decisions now give you time to reset and work everything out before Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum hit their real primes. If you haven't achieved your goals, but do you believe? But you do believe in the core. In the few years, the budget and assets pressure you uh, to make um, impossible moves to do anything. But if you can find the partner, um, and uh, but if you don't believe. Uh, in the future with this core, it's just a little too late. Uh, it was the time to make commitment to the, it is the time to make commitment to the direction. Uh, trading for expiring Evan Fournier is closing your eyes and hoping that no one gets mad at you. Uh, that was really interesting article. So I will start with uh, Daniel. Uh, so we discussed on the previous show uh, what do you think? I mean, we can talk the whole night, but in shortly, uh, what do you think about good possibilities, bad possibilities trading for uh, Fournier, upside and downside? Uh, Danny? Well, I can say this. I, you know, mentioned it to the on the radio show last week to you, and I know me and a Andrew got into a bit of a debate in our uh, chat in this situation. Fournier's deal is going to come down to whether or not he actually stays. That's really going to be the the key the key situation here. You know, twenty eight million dollars. You got a traded player exception that you could have used basically. All the way in this offseason, I don't know, on any player basically that would have been out there in the open market. You know, you mentioned one player earlier that uh, is supposedly going to become available this summer, Al Horford, that could have easily been, you know, available to be ha to be gotten with that traded player exception if you would have had it in full, you know, contact. Funny is not going to change us being an NBA championship contender this season. You know, we've all agreed to that. You know, we've said it already before. This season, basically, it's all about him now playing the playing the best he can and already trying to show what he can do with the rest of the team the rest of this, you know, season. But if he walks away and doesn't bother to return and you get absolutely nothing, because, you know, everybody seems to think that it's a guarantee you're going to get something in exchange for 48. Only way you get anything for Fournier is if Fournier does for you what out with uh, what uh, Gordon Hayward chose to do for you, which was agree to a signing trade deal. But Fournier could simply walk, you know, pack his bags and go somewhere else without having to basically do anything for you to get anything in return, you know, because he's a unrestricted free agent. He's not a restricted one, so he can get up and pack his bags and go elsewhere. And leave you with jack nothing, which means not only do you not have him, now your traded player exception is basically you know cut, you know cut in half basically, and you have no asset at this point. Which is why I said if it would have been me, knowing that Fournier is not going to really do nothing to change you know the complete you know the way the pathway that you were going this season, I would have preferred personally to have seen Danny Ainge hold on to that traded player exception until this summer. And then talked to Fournier in free agency to see if Fournier would have been willing to actually sign with the Celtics long term. And if he said yes, I'm willing to you know sign with you on a four year deal, max you know let's say twenty million dollars per season, so a four year eighty million dollar deal. 
then you go ahead and you make the signing trade deal with, you know, the team he's on, you know, in this case, and you get him at that point. So basically, you know, like, you know, Andy made it, you know, made the point with me and him in our debate that at that point you may have to give up a little bit more in this situation, which is true. But at the same time, at least you're guaranteed that you're basically going to have him for an entire four-year, you know, term. Compared to basically now, where you're basically in a position where, for all you know, he could walk away and you're not going to get a darn thing. But at the same time, if he says no straight to Danny Ainge's face, I'm not interested in staying in Boston long term, then at least you still have that $28 million traded player exception intact, and you can still use it on any other player on the market or players that will be on the market or become available in the, you know, in the traded player, you know, the trade market in this case. So that's all I'm going to come down to that anymore. Flutter, I think, overall is a decent player in terms of, you know, the talent he's got in this situation. I think ultimately it's going to be, uh, how can I say, uh, it's going to be a situation of um, him and Marcus Smart battling for who's going to take that spot, being, you know, next to Kemba, Tatum, and Brown. Because I think those are the only two you can really give that, you know, that fourth man spot to. And then obviously Time Lord, I think, is going to solidify himself as the center. But uh, if Fournier doesn't stay, then that trade goes down as a flop in this situation, in the end. And it'll prove that Danny Ainge in this situation, he jumped the gun a little too quickly. Igor, your mic is muted. Andy, uh, do you want to add uh, something on the subject? I mean, a lot of uh, possibilities uh, with Fournier on the summer that we have been discussing, you know? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think, first of all, um, like, first of all, I think a lot of people operate under the assumption or the belief that this wasn't something that was discussed it, or discussed, I'm sorry, with Fournier before we did the trade. I'm sure that there was some level, you know, there's there's only some level of discussion in terms of long-term plans, and it might not be that detailed, but, you know, Danny Ainge has been in this business for a long time. He's not, you know, and we also know the other thing is that Ainge has always been very adverse to making big mid-season trades on expiring contracts. He's always been very adverse to that. So if he traded for Fournier, then I think we have to, we have to think that he had spoken to Fournier or his agent and gotten some sort of a assurance that they would give Boston, you know, they would give Boston heavy consideration to be, you know, to resign with. The, the other thing I think is that the TPE was always kind of a gamble. I mean, um, you know, we, we, we could hold it, we could have used it, we could have held it, but I didn't really see a lot of great options coming up available that we could have traded for in the offseason. A lot of people were moved at the trade deadline. Um, I was actually surprised by how many players moved at the trade deadline. I kind of thought some of these teams, like Orlando, I thought they might hold on to some of their guys until the offseason, but, you know, they did. They didn't, so... Um, <clears throat> I and mean, the thing is to me is like, you know, like the TBE was always kind of a freebie anyway. I mean, we basically got that because we were lucky and Gordon Hayward decided not to totally screw the franchise when he left. And that's basically how we got the TPE. So it's, you know, we basically got it. I, I wouldn't say for free, but it was a, it was a gimme because we could very easily have not gotten it too. And if you hold it for the offseason, like, yeah, somebody might come available, but like Al Horford, I don't think, you know, he wasn't going to move the needle for us, whether we signed him, to, you know, to a bet minimum or not. You know, and even if we did that, you know, we could still sign him to a bet minimum or sign and trade with the TPE, right? You know, we still have enough money to do that. So the thing that, you know, the thing that you could miss on is, you know, maybe the Magic decide not to trade Fournier, or maybe they decide to trade with somebody else on this trade deadline if Boston didn't ask for him. And then you're stuck there holding a TPE with no great options in the offseason either. And now you now you get absolutely nothing. You know, the other, the other thing is we didn't really give up anything for Fournier. And that's why I don't view the trade as being a flop. Even if Fournier decides to walk in the offseason and we don't get anything in return, I don't view that as a flop because we never gave anything to start with. You know, it's not like, you know, it's not like we traded Marcus Smart for Fournier. I, like, I would be 100% against that deal because you, know, you just traded the guy that we know is an important part of the team 
for somebody who could leave next season, you know, for nothing. But we gave two second round picks, which I mean, I think you could buy second round picks, you know, like you could literally teams could literally buy them. So we, we didn't lose anything and we got a guy who could score 20 points a game. If we make the assumption that Danny Ainge talked to him about long-term that we got a guy who could score 20 points a game who at least gave us some sort of assurance that he's going to give us preference in free agency this summer. And we got it for nothing. I mean, I, I'd be happy, you know, we got him to play for us this season. I'd be happy if we got that, you know, if we got that sort of assurance without him coming to the team. So, I mean, I, I don't view it as being a flop. I think it's disappointing if you expected a lot from the TP. Uh, but I always had pretty low expectations for the TPE, to be honest. I, I mean, it's just not something uh, you'll see a lot of teams who are going to be like, oh, yeah, let me trade you a $25 million a year player for a trade player exception. That sounds like a great deal. You know, unless you have a GM that's really trying to get fired or something, you know, they're, they're not going to make that deal for you. And so, honestly, Fournier is about like kind of the best case scenario that I saw us getting with the TPE. Um, and I think he helps us now and maybe he, you know, he's not going to put us in contention with the nets, but he is a guy who could take us over a team like maybe the bucks, like the bucks, they look good on paper. They've sort of been hit or miss on the eye test. And I'm not convinced that Giannis really has that next level in the playoffs. I, you know, at this point, we've seen enough of Giannis not having, not being that guy in the playoffs that he's going to have to prove that he is. For me to believe it now. So, you know, it, Fournier is not going to bring us over the nets, but he's also the type of guy that if he's on the roster and say Joel Embiid gets injured and Kyrie or Harvey or Harden goes down, he's the type of guy who said he's on the roster all of a sudden, like, wow, you know, they're missing a key piece. We now have a chance. Whereas before I wouldn't have given us that chance. So, I mean, like, so I really don't have a problem with Fournier being signed because, you know, like, I don't think he makes us a favorite but he puts us in position to take advantage of an opportunity, which is, that's almost as important as being a favorite. I mean, look at Toronto, even when they added Kawhi, I don't think anybody thought that it was like, oh yeah, the Toronto Raptors are going to win the championship this year. I, I know I didn't think that. I don't think anybody else did. I think if anybody says that now, they're lying or they're a diehard Raptors fan who thinks they're going to win the championship every year. Um, because nobody thought that. I mean, the Warriors had Steph, Clay, KD, DeMarcus Cousins, Draymond Green. They, they were looked unbeatable. But Toronto got themselves to pieces so that when those opportunities opened up and those players went down injured, they were in position with the right pieces to exploit that opportunity and win a title. And if you can't be the favorite, because, you know, let's face it, there's only like one favorite to win a conference. You know, that's kind of how that works. But you know, you want to be one of those people that gets the pieces that give you a chance if the opportunity arrives. And I think Fournier is that type of player who does give us a chance if, you know, say, you know, Harden goes down with an injury. I think he's the type of guy who could take us to that level where we could compete with Brooklyn now that they have two stars instead of three. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Kevin um, uh, has to... Uh... Uh, close the show with uh, Fournier talk. I will add a couple of sentences and then he's gone and that's pretty much it. So, Kevin? About Fournier or he maybe uh, is tired. I mean, what uh, then is back. Uh, what I want to say, Andy and the guys, I mean, Ryan is practically um, Ryan is practically um, correct. Uh, depends on the results. And depends on the next contract, you know. Uh, Andy, you are uh, correct that uh, uh, if we lose him for free, uh, we paid uh, only two uh, second round picks. But uh, that means that we use uh, the TPE larger parts, like 17 point something million, 18 millions, whatever. We are left like uh, 11 millions or 10 point something millions, I don't know. So we use TP um, for practically nothing, you know, and what we could do, I don't know, in the summer, there are free agents, but uh, Ryan mentioned one possibility. For example, you're putting dominoes like the names used to do, you know, for example, uh, if if you want to, to try to trade ties, you're trading ties for future assets, some of the future assets. Okay, it was low cost move. 
we got yourself on the on the seal on the edge of the fire okay for example you literally have two minutes before the end of the trade that deadline to get out of the tax line and of course the team is saying well you've got to pay us you know and you get to t trade daniel ties that's what happened but um, for example we could move uh, wait for the summer uh, and move uh, with the tpe uh, try to move walker we discussed trading walker you know trading walker would cost us assets so uh, you add tpe walker you add couple of picks you know and get for example pa uh, he mentioned patrick beverly luke Kennard, and man guy you know uh, and another tpe that is walker salary and then you use that walker's tpe to try to trade for bradley Beal if opportunity comes to you okay i mean it doesn't have to be the trade right now if we resign fournier like he said 15 millions three years two years whatever this is the good deal this is the good deal no matter outcome of the season uh but if we sign him four years 80 millions then you heard either walker or smart will have to go because we don't want to pay the tax okay and we're close to the tax next line and with fournier and the extension of 20 millions uh 2021 22nd tax bill would be 44 millions can you imagine big grousebeck to pay 44 millions he he in, in 2010 he paid maximum tax line with the revenue percent like today 15 millions if i'm correct between 10 and 15 millions this is what is the calculation so we will see what happens fournier is extremely good player don't get me wrong he will help us but um, we will see the outcome you know again if we sign him to reasonable contract i think it's worth it um, okay uh, i think that this is uh, the right time to end the show uh daniel uh if you can hear me so this is the end of the show uh kevin is tired so we are all tired uh, but we enjoyed and we will definitely speak with you the next month hopefully right danny yeah so ladies and gentlemen we'll talk to you again uh next saturday night 6 uh, 7 p.m eastern time uh regular show so we'll all see you then all right sounds good all right you guys that's all. Happy Easter. Yeah. Yeah, have a good Easter. Yeah.